All right. So the draft day three, and it's been going on for some time, but, you know, things have got to get going in the morning uh, that are not football related in everybody's life. So we've got some recapping to do. There's a handful of players that are pretty interesting to me that have gone. Now, this is the range where interior offensive linemen, defensive backs, backup uh, offensive linemen are going all over the place, but you're getting some starters, specifically the guard position. Uh, Starting guards happen in the fourth and fifth round all the damn time. Um, It's relatively devalued. Um, Offensive line is a position that hasn't it been effective in the NFL for a long time. It's not a glorified position. And because of that, the, the best talent's not going to it. So but there are a lot of guards that are going, that are actually going to end up starting like a Solomon Kindley for the, um, for the dolphins that went earlier today at one eleven. he's likely to end up being a starter. There's running backs that are going to be starters in this league as well. So think about the chargers. They, uh, have Austin Eckler, yes, but they lost Melvin Gordon. And what did they replace him with? UCLA product Joshua, Joshua Kelly. Um, so Kelly is the perfect example of why running back does not go early anymore. Because he's going to step in and he's going to be effective. He's, he's not necessarily going to be the game breaker. He's not necessarily going to be an offensive focus, but he's going to be effective enough. He's going to catch balls out of the backfield and he's going to learn from Austin Eckler. He's going to be a, probably a little bit more of an early down back than Eckler is uh, more of a run between the tackles kind of guy. Um, but you're going to be able to carve a role out on your team for a guy like that. And and that's why running backs being devalued because, well, wide receiver is the same sort of situation. You're carving out a role. You, you set up the receivers like you set up a basketball team. So you, you've got your bigger guy who's going to be a high point ball catcher in the end zone. You've got a smaller speedy guy who, who's going to take the top off of the back of the defense. Um, and you've got some middle range kind of all purpose guys who you're you're looking for just finding soft spots and zones and things of that nature and take advantage of what the other players are doing for them. So it, you're seeing that in receiving cores, how people are drafting, but receivers are more valuable than running backs because they last longer in the league. Okay. You're going to get 10 years out of a receiver instead of four out of a running back, um, as long as it's a quality receiver. So you're going to see those guys go earlier. Look at, you know, Emmanuel Sanders. He's still extremely, extremely productive. And now he's on his fourth team and he's done extremely well in Pittsburgh. He's done extremely well in Denver. He's done extremely well in San Francisco, though it was a short, uh, stint there. And he was really just a rental player. Um, And he got injured during the playoffs, but he's moving to New Orleans now, and he's going to continually extend this career. So receivers are drafted high and and more valuable than running backs now simply because they last longer. It's not because of how much they are used. They're used, honestly, any single receiver is generally used a bit less than your primary running back, but running backs. By committee now, if you're doing two, three running backs, not the case. So, again, um, Joshua Kelly for running back out of UCLA going to the Chargers is going to have an immediate impact. Uh, Solomon Kindley, guard for um, Dolphins, is going to have an immediate impact and likely be a starter because that offensive line was god awful. So, you're getting serious players, people that are going to be in the league for a long time and have an immediate impact on these teams in the fourth round. And that's going to continue. You have that tight end was a little bit of a disappointing position this year. Um, The guy out of Dayton that was drafted yesterday, um, he is going to likely be an effective starter. Um, I was surprised that Albert O out of Missouri um, didn't go earlier, and I'm even more surprised that he ended up going to the Denver Broncos. So 
Albert O, if you look at his physical stuff, that what he did at the combine, he's just popping off the chart. Uh, he is an all around athlete, um, has basketball experience. I, I, you're talking about a guy who profiles um, physically uh, like a Tony Gonzalez. And he just doesn't have um, the chops, the, the stats. Um, it doesn't necessarily have a hell of a lot of experience at the position. So he, he's kind of the prototype for the modern tight end. Uh, you, you look at the modern tight end. It, it was the Antonio Gateses. Uh, okay. Um, Tony Gonzalez is, is a good example as well. You, you have guys that played basketball and are just really good physical specimens. And the tight end position is such a, a strange niche that they're match up hell. So they're faster than linebackers. So linebackers can't cover them. They're bigger and stronger than safeties. So safeties can't cover them. And, and that's the whole reason for the rise of these tweener defensive positions that are coming out. Um, yesterday, Jeremy Chin and um, Xavier McKinney are very good examples of this, where they've played safety, they played linebacker, they played nickel, and they're a tweener body type, very, very similar to these tight ends that were coming out, what, 20 years ago. So people can still find these kinds of tight ends in the draft. Okay, uh, tight end is not a position that people go out for in high school and pop Warner. Okay. Tight end is, is such a mishmash of things. You've got to be very good at a great deal of things, and it takes time to develop. George Kittle wasn't a phenom his rookie year, okay? It, it was his second, third year before he started coming out as just a truly dominant player at his position. Now, he's fully developed at his position. He blocks like no other tight end in the league, and he's still a very, very effective receiver. And that's what a lot of the tight ends that you're showing late in the draft here have the potential to be. They're just not there yet. They, they haven't received the coaching. They haven't received the experience to be a regular every down tight end where they have to block. They have to run a good route tree. They have to know zone concepts and where to sit within a zone in order to make sure they're open. They have to know how to deal with press man, or they have to know how to chip somebody on the outside before they break off into their own route. There's a lot on their plate. So college tight ends, you can't genuinely tell what's going to end up being the peak of these guys' career. So like Asiasi, who went yesterday, the uh, UCLA product, he's a prime example of that as well. He, he's a superior athlete, and he looks great catching the ball. He doesn't run routes, okay? He, he doesn't know uh, NFL blocking concepts. So uh, all these talking heads talking about, oh, this guy's going to be great. These guys are going to be fantastic. No, he, he's not going to be great. He has the potential to be great. He, he has the frame. He seems like he has the will. And it's a matter of what he does with it when he gets to the league, because it's a very difficult position to transition into. I don't understand people drafting tight end top 10, either in the real draft or a fantasy football draft, because there's too many factors. So um, Hawkinson, when he went, even Noah Fant, when he went last year in the first round, I don't get it. I don't. Because there's always somebody like the Bills picking up Dawson Knox, uh, where he, he had real effect. And he ended up looking really good when he got the ball in his hands. It was late in the season because he took time to develop. But it, do you really see a horrible difference between those players where it, it makes sense to draft one in the top 10 and another goes in the fourth round? It, it It's batshit to me. So the players that are going in the first are, are players that should have an immediate impact because they're going to be able to plug in and understand NFL concepts right away. These fourth and fifth round players, it's not a matter that they're not going to be good pros. It's a matter that we haven't seen it from them because they haven't been playing at programs that have NFL style offenses or NFL style defenses. Um, so running down some of the people that have gone in the fourth round here, 
Um, running backs uh, from Florida going to the Jets, um, LaMichael uh, Perrine. That is a sign to me that Adam Gase really did not want Le'Veon Bell. And that was the discussion we were having last year anyway. One of the reasons that the GM for the Jets got pushed out last year was Adam Gase and him were butting heads about how much he was giving up to get Le'Veon Bell. And running backs devalued. Why is running back devalued? Again, they only last like four or five years during their peak. And that's the beginning of their career is usually their peak. So the Barry Sanders of the world are, are rare. Oh, okay. Um, Freaking um, Marshawn Lynch. Um, you have examples of players that ended up having very long, very successful careers. Frank Gore is an example of that. You just, you don't see it often. Okay. The average shelf life of an NFL player in general is three years. They say NFL stands for not for long. So considering you have a position that gets to beat the hell up all the damn time in running back, yeah, that's even more likely to affect them. So yeah, you shouldn't draft players that you can't necessarily say are going to translate to the NFL game immediately right away. You shouldn't draft players that are likely only going to last, you know, three to five years before they're, useless and you have to move on to somebody else right away. You got to save those for later on, which is why the George Edwards Hilaire pick from Kansas City at the end of the first round is probably the most baffling to me because not only did I have probably four running backs higher than him in my personal film study, it's still a fucking running back. And if you're going to get a running back, get the best one available. Uh, okay. And now this is a film study preferential sort of thing, I'm sure. There are things that I really loved about George Edwards Hilaire. There's things that I hated about Edwards Hilaire. Um, I don't see him as physically gifted any more or less than, say, oh, Jonathan Taylor. All right. Uh, they compare pretty well as far as their feet and uh, making people miss catching out of the backfield and uh, running instincts. Um, where they don't compare well is um, Taylor is way faster, way faster. This guy runs a 4.3, Edwards Hilaire is more like a 4.5. Um, so you have game-breaking speed out of Taylor that you weren't going to have out of Hilaire, but you also have a lot of use on Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor's got 900 carries plus in his college career. And you, you can worry about that. You can say, okay, Edwards Hilaire is probably going to be more on the five-year span and Jonathan Taylor is more on the three-year, but it's still a running back. Uh, okay. So if, if you think they're extremely, extremely similar talent-wise, why don't you wait to the second round, get Taylor and use your first round pick for, I don't know, better protection for your quarterback or a better defensive back for your defense, which is going to be in a track meet every freaking week because your offense is racking up points so well, the other team is going to be giving you their best shot on offense every single fucking week. So I just, I'm baffled by the Edwards Hilaire pick. But here we are in the fourth round and, well, getting into the fifth round now, but we have a couple of interesting players. Uh, Kayvon Wallace going at pick 21 to the Philadelphia Eagles is going to be an immediate fill at um, special teams. But he, considering he went to the Eagles and they have a need at safety, he might actually end up stepping in by week one in a starting position. Um, you have... Everybody likes the the freaking quarterbacks. And it's amazing to me that ESPN and NFL Network just really focus on these quarterbacks. Where are the quarterbacks going? There were five that everybody knew were worth it. And they all went in the first two rounds. And then they start focusing on the Washington guy, the, the Georgia guy. And like, oh, where are these quarterbacks going? They're the next best ones. They had second round grades on them. Shut the fuck up. 
Okay, second round grades. I'm going to waste a second round pick on somebody who's not going to see the fucking field. I don't need a clipboard holder for a second round pick. Okay, I need a guy who's going to contribute for a second round pick. I need a guy who's going to be out there on the field for 75% of the downs. Okay, I need a defensive back. I need an offensive lineman. I need a defensive tackle. The guys that are actually going to be able to do something in the league in their first year. Because a backup fucking quarterback from Georgia who's going to need three years to figure out what the fucking NFL defense is, is not that. So fuck you and your second round grade on goddamn Jake Fromm, okay? The guy's going to go as early as the fifth, maybe. Maybe, okay? I I just, I'm tired of seeing the cameras in these kids' living rooms making them feel like shit, thinking they should go earlier in the draft when they're just not going to go. It, it, it's stupid to me. Uh, grading Jake Fromm in the second round. Fucking shit. Anyways, um, so we have some, again, decent talent going in the fourth round that's going to have more immediate impact. I'm looking at Amik Robertson, the Louisiana Tech uh, corner that went to the Raiders. And again, because of the team he's going to, this is a guy who's likely going to compete for a starting spot. Okay, so corner, you have, you you never have enough of them. Okay, because not only can they contribute on special teams, but at any given time, you might need five of them on the field. And if you need five DBs on the field, you also need some reserves for that. So if your roster doesn't include six, maybe seven solid people that can play corner, um, by the end of the season, you could be having real problems with your death anytime somebody goes into a four-receiver set or a five-receiver set. So it, it can cause serious issues if you don't have proper death. So Amik Robertson, I'm expecting to be an impact this year. Most teams play in the nickel or dime 70 to 80% of the time. Okay, the the traditional base defenses of 4-3 and 3-4 are rare these days. They're typically your new goal line setups or or when you get close to that range. Um, There's very, very few situations where you have all the big bodies on the field anymore. So you're getting these coverage guys out there in action much more frequently. And this is why I really don't like these second or third round grades on people like Jake Fromm, because these corners drafted in the fourth and even the fifth round are so much more likely to actually have an active role on the roster than these backup quarterbacks do. Because that's exactly what Jake Fromm freaking is. All right. He's going to be a backup. He might pan out to be a starter eventually. There's plenty of quarterbacks that have gone in the fourth and fifth round that have ended up being good players. Okay. Obviously the goat Tom Brady, but you have Kirk Cousins, you have, um, I want to say Russell Wilson was a fourth round pick. So there's plenty of examples of later round picks that have turned into successful starters. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying as far as drafting goes, the risk and the percentages do not line up with that quarterback having a chance to contribute, whereas the defensive back is certainly going to contribute. So since there's far less risk that you're wasting the pick, at this point, a defensive back just makes more sense for most teams. So at rolling down the line, I'm also interested in um, more recent pick number 40, Tyler um, Baidez. I, I, I'm going to butcher some of these names here. Uh, Wisconsin center. Wisconsin offensive linemen typically do extremely well in the league. They have a offensive set and a coaching that is more pro style for the blocking schematics. And they've dealt with the weather. Okay. They've dealt with playing outside in awful. And you want your offensive linemen to be tough. So you see offensive linemen coming out of schools like Wisconsin and Iowa all the time doing extremely well in the league, having long careers, not necessarily being 
phenoms and, and popping off the tape, but successful long careers. So I anticipate with the moves that the Cowboys are making that they're doing some good things, revamping their defense and their offense in the draft. So I think the addition of Mike McCarthy to the conversation might really be helping out Jerry Jones and crew. They've been getting better at drafting in general. But um, yeah, I, I think that this is a solid, solid draft for the Cowboys. Now, the fifth round just started and Khalid Kareem, uh, edge rusher out of Notre Dame, went to the Bengals. Now, Kareem, you don't look at as much because the outside edge rusher on the other side, Aquara, um, he drew a lot of water. Uh, okay, Julian Aquara is the kind of guy who just because of off-field issues and a few injuries, he, he dropped out of the first and second round talk. Um, but that's the kind of talent he had. Okay, he just can wreak havoc on an offensive line in a blocking scheme. So when you have a guy like that on the opposite side, drawing a lot of attention from the blocking scheme, uh, a Khalid Kareem may be a solid player, sure. He might also be a goddamn train wreck. And he was just benefiting and getting a statistical advantage from Julian Aquara on the opposite side. You see this in college football all the time. You also see extremely, extremely well-built defensive lines often enough. You can say that about Clemson. Um, so Clemson last year had three first-round picks on their uh, defensive line. And I want to say a second or third round pick was the other guy. So all those guys were actually legitimate talents. You, you can't say that about everybody. So most of the defensive lines throughout college football will have one, maybe two guys that are solid. One of them is an obvious pro and he gets a lot of attention from the blocking scheme. And the other guy, he's just doing really well because he's always got single man blocking on him and it's easy for him to beat single man blocking. But the moment he gets a double on him, he, he's just nullified and doesn't do shit. So Khalid Kareem, uh, I just, I'm not really sure he's going to end up working out. Just don't think so. So um, number two pick in the fifth round, we have Alton Robinson, another edge rusher out of Syracuse. So people are building up the defensive line rotation. So edge rusher uh, going to Seattle here. It's a good program to be going into. Um, Syracuse really hasn't been a fantastic program since Doug Marone left. Obviously, he's in the NFL now. Um, so you can definitely expect a bit of a drop off from going from a guy who ended up going to the NFL to an, an also ran uh, college head coach. So they're not producing as much NFL talent as they used to. I would anticipate Alton Robinson really is going to need to hustle in order to get into a rotational role. Now, that's going to work well with what Seattle's got going on because, I mean, they still haven't signed Jadavion Clowney. They're, they're looking for edge rushing talent, and he may be able to carve out a niche in this roster where he's seeing 20, 30 percent of the snaps as the season goes on, and he'll have time to develop because replacing a Jadavion Clowney does not happen with one guy. It, it happens with two or three that you're rotating out there because you have fresh legs all the time. Um, so I would anticipate Alton Robinson to get on the field and, you know, 20, 30% of the snaps during the season, situational pass rusher. And that is probably going to be a career niche for him. I'm not expecting him to be any sort of phenom in the league, but a lot of these guys, since they're not receiving the quality coaching in Syracuse, you just don't know. You, you just don't know. Uh, okay. So once they get to the league, they're getting better coaching. They're surrounded by teammates that are also coaching them up that are higher quality teammates and know a few things about the techniques of their position. They have the ability to now, because they're making more money, hire coaches for their own off season. Um, that's what a lot of these you know, first round draft picks are doing. Their agents are hiring pros to come into their camp 
and show them what it's like to be a pro. Okay, you have Jordan Palmer, who is a former NFL player, a washout, but also the brother of a former NFL player that a lot of people like and calls Carson Palmer. Um, and he also had a TJ Hushmanzada in his camp. And you've got these former NFL players showing him what it's like to have an NFL training routine. Well, these fourth and fifth round guys, they don't have agents throwing money around in order to make sure that that happens. So they don't have access in that way. So a lot of the later round picks, if you can find a later round pick who is a legacy player, you know, that's why I really liked Antoine Winfield Jr. His dad was a former all pro, played for multiple different teams and multiple different defensive sets and did extremely, extremely well in the league. So whereas he doesn't have the agents giving him this, you know, pro personnel background to really help him along. His dad was a pro and, and can show him what he needs to do in order to become an NFL player. So legacy players in later rounds make a hell of a lot of sense to me because they're just going to come in day one knowing what they're supposed to do. And that's a huge benefit because most of these fourth, fifth, sixth round guys, it's a culture shock. They're coming into a situation where they have to essentially work out for a living. You know, they, they don't have class to go to. They don't have a day job like the rest of us. They have to show up and work out, learn more about football, learn more about specific techniques, hand placement when they're engaged with the defender, that sort of thing. And a level of depth for their craft that they've never had to get into. Some people do extremely well with it. Some people don't. Most people, the grind of it, the, the fact that it turns into a job instead of just a game is the reason that it washes them out of the league. They weren't ready for it to be a job. They weren't ready for it to be something that they had to look at from a professional standpoint. Others really bloom from that. This is why you have fourth, fifth, and sixth round players turning into Hall of Fame players all the time. And, you know, you, in hindsight, you look back on it like, man, why the hell did that guy go so late? Well, it's because he came from a small school or he was buried on the bench of a bigger program and he did not have access to working out and studying film and studying techniques for his position until he reached the league. And now that he's got all that access, he's got all that information, he can actually truly engage in his craft and become the better pro. So I really like watching these later rounds because, you know, Danny Pinter here, uh, third in the fifth round guard going to the Indianapolis Colts. Coming out of Ball State, Danny Pinter has never had access to the level of film study, coaching, and um, training his body that he's going to have with the Indianapolis Colts. He's never had access to be able to pick the brain of a pro like Quentin Nelson, where he's going to be able to learn from somebody who's already extremely successful at his job. Who knows? When he gets access to dietitians, uh, to better trainers, to just a better training facility, to film study, to pros sitting in the locker next to him, teaching him different techniques that they know, to coaches that are teaching him better techniques in the league. Once he finally has access to these things, he might turn into an all-star. He might turn into the kind of guard that doesn't let a single pressure go in all season and doesn't have any false starts, doesn't have any holding penalties, just a solid dude that you never hear the name of because he's always doing his job well. That's the life of an NFL guard, by the way. You never hear their name unless they're fucking up. Um, unless you're Quentin Nelson who has a fucking war cry and just pancakes people in his blocks. That guy is a joy to watch. 
it, the, he's probably the only one, but if you want to watch film on a guard that just puts a smile on your face, Quentin Nelson flies around the field with a reckless abandon and watching him fly into human beings that are half his weight and just decimate them on a pull block is a true joy in my life. Um, but we're moving along and the Giants have selected Shane Lemieux, guard out of Oregon. The uh, Chargers have selected Joe Reed, wide receiver out of Virginia. Now, Oregon, I think, is the pick here. Shane Lemieux was part of one of, if not the best, offensive lines in all of college football. Um, when you watch film on Derek Brown, we're talking about the best defensive tackle to come out in this draft, uh, an absolute mammoth man who was just pushing people around every single play. He would take on double and triple teams and push them back into the backfield. It, it was absolutely insane, the level of playing strength that Derek Brown is bringing to the table. I watched film against Oregon. They were able to actually deal with him. The Oregon offensive line actually were able to contain him in a way where they could put a competitive game together. And they were keeping a top quarterback clean the whole time. It definitely one of, if not the best, offensive lines in college football. So getting a guard from that program is going to be hugely beneficial for the Giants. This guy is going to start. Lemieux will be a starting guard for the Giants. And the Giants desperately need offensive line help. They have needed somebody in front of uh, Daniel Jones, in front of Saquon Barkley. And, and addressing it the way they have in this draft is got to be putting a smile on the face of Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley and Giants fans. Because earlier in the draft, picking up Andrew Thomas, uh, the best tackle in college football out of Georgia. Another fantastic offensive line, by the way. Uh, they have now, I want to say, three uh, drafted players out of the Georgia offensive line. And they, they're, they're going to do well for the Giants this season. Uh, they, they had a very good draft last year. You say what you will about Daniel Jones being overdrafted where he was at the position. I still think they could have got him in the late first, if not the early second round. They ended up drafting him top 10. But there's also the rule of if you like a guy and you're sold on him, just go get him. So looking back on it, Daniel Jones really, he looks like a legitimate NFL quarterback. So is that worth a top 10 pick every time? Absolutely. So regardless of where they could have gotten him last year, they ended up being right. And then you look at the rest of their draft, and they did extremely, extremely well. So the Giants are drafting really, really well of late. Um, they have... You know, they got Saquon Barkley early. They got him in the second overall pick. I didn't necessarily like that they drafted a running back second overall. Um, that's a position that generally washes out of the league uh, relatively quickly. So it's high draft capital to spend on somebody who might not have a very long career. And, and Daniel Jones, I, I think they overdrafted, but you cannot dispute their talent. You, you can't dispute what you saw on film last year with Daniel Jones looking like a legitimate NFL talent. And you cannot dispute what you've seen out of Saquon Barkley the past couple of seasons because he's the best running back in the league. You can make an argument for Christian McCaffrey, but Christian McCaffrey is more of a hybrid player. He, he's a, a better running back because of his receiving threat. Not because of his, you know, just general running back skills. If it's just the rushing, Saquon Barkley all day. If you add the receiving, yes, Christian McCaffrey. Um, so, again, Giants really like what you're doing. Um, Shane Lemieux is going to be extremely good for you moving forward. 
Um, Joe Reed is a meh, whatever. Um, going in at receiver for the Chargers, is he ever going to get playing time? Uh, that's a guy that's going to have to contribute on special teams in order to make a roster. Because with the receiving talent in front of him for the Chargers, I don't see an easy way onto the field otherwise. Um, Kenny Robinson, safety out of West Virginia, going to the Carolina Panthers. They have needed to build up their defense. They have addressed their defense extremely well in this draft. All right. They have Derek Brown. They've gotten, what was it, Etor Gross Matos they picked up, and then Jeremy Chin, and now Kenny Robinson. So you're creating depth at a position where you really had a great deal of need. By addressing the defense with so many draft picks like this, you're injecting a lot of youth in, which is a good idea because, I mean, who did you walk away from? You walked away from players like Mario Addison, who's in his 30s at a defensive end position, which, you know, once you get into your 30s at the defensive end position, you're kind of over the hill. So... Replacing him with Derek Brown, Nitor Grossmatos. Again, youth, and you're turning a weakness into a strength. So kudos to the Panthers for how they have addressed this draft. Um, just got the selection at number seven in from San Francisco. The tackle out of West Virginia, Colton McKivitz. Um, he is going to be a rotational offensive lineman. Uh, swing tackle, backup tackle. They just traded for uh, one of the best tackles in the league, Williams out of Washington, who's been demanding a trade for some time because he no longer trusted the Washington coaching and training staff, considering how they dealt with whatever tumor was growing out of his head. Um, yeah, you have no chance between that guy and McGlinchey to be a starting tackle for San Francisco. It's not going to happen. So that is a depth player and somebody that they're going to be developing over time. But that's what you do at this point. You know, offensive line depth needs to happen. You need to have three or four tackles on your roster. You need to have like three or four guards with one or two of those guards being able to play center along with another true center. So. You need depth on the offensive line. Not a lot of teams actually address that and keep that on the roster. Some have a backup for every position. You know, some have 10 offensive linemen. Others have seven. So people that have uh, positional flexibility on the offensive line is a boom. You know, you, you really want to have somebody who can play guard and tackle, both guard positions or both tackle positions or center and guard. That way, you can have one backup position on your roster instead of two. So being able to lighten the load on the roster with how many offensive linemen you dress on game day is a benefit. So a player like Colton McKivitz, if he doesn't bring – flexibility where he can play both tackle positions or he can play tackle or guard. And I, I don't even see him having a clear path to make the team if I'm honest, but pick is in for the dolphins. Now round five, they have, I, I guess found a way to get into the 154 pick your um, yeah, there, there's a lot of trades that have moved things around here. So I think the fifth round, sixth round trades are very, very interesting because these are players that aren't necessarily likely to make the team, but they have to have a coach or a scout in the room, just pounding the table for that dude. Like I watched film on this guy and he's going to be a serious fucking pro kind of thing. So Somebody in the Miami organization, considering how many different teams this pick was traded through, definitely had to have loved um, Jason Strobridge, defensive end out of North Carolina. Now, North Carolina is not typically a big-time program, but it 
produced, oh, God, North Carolina. Was that Mitch Trubisky's alma mater, if I'm not mistaken? So, yeah, you get pro players out of there now and again. I want to say Robert Quinn came out of North Carolina. So it's not, you know, perennial NFL talent. The ACC schools are typically basketball. But now and again, you you get a good NFL talent out of them. So I'm not going to say Jason Strobridge is going to be a washout just yet, because obviously the scouts of the Miami Dolphins really love the guy, considering, again, got traded through two teams before it got to them. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really have a hell of a lot of good things to say about Strobridge. I, I've watched very little film on North Carolina, um, understandably, but the film that I did watch, Strobridge did not really pop off the tape. So somebody has to know something about him, some sort of inside information that made him you know, a valuable pick for them. Um, Bears are picking number 10 in the fifth round here. Uh, pick is in putting Washington on the clock. Let's see what this comes in at. This is another pick that's been traded through a bunch of different play, uh, teams. So Cleveland, Buffalo, Minnesota have all had this pick, but it ends up in the lap of the Chicago Bears. Man, the coverage of the draft obviously gets very, very bad over time. So first and second rounds, you're looking at the commissioners, hands on. It's prime time, even the third round. Um, you've got all the, the big name talking heads are involved. And then you get to day three, round four, five, six, and seven. Nobody really cares. So... There's the also rans, you know, the commissioner is no longer involved. It's like one or two of his lackeys. Um, the, you know, first string uh, draft analysis people aren't really involved in the coverage anymore. It, it, you know, you'll still have like the Mel Kuypers of the world because the draft is just their thing. But the people talking to Mel Kuyper are no longer like, oh, Trey Wingo or, or, or the other top tier talent at ESPN. You, you're not having the good morning football crew uh, on NFL network talking with the draft coverage. You're getting the B squad. You're, you're getting the people that usually get squirreled away on like midday Tuesday kind of airtime. Um, so I, I, the draft day three is not just for, NFL players trying to make their name. It's also for announcers and media people trying to make their name. It's also for the people who don't have a hell of a lot of skin in the game right now, and they're trying to build that clout. So I'm always interested in the coverage of these things. So now pick 10, um, the Bears picked up uh, Travis Gibson, a defensive end out of Tulsa. Now, Tulsa is a decent uh, NFL talent school. They, they have produced um, some NFL draftable talent over the years. Not a hell of a lot. You know, you, you always worry about the level of competition um, that players have gone against from a, a team like Tulsa. You're watching film on these guys and you say, OK, well, this dude just manhandled that guard. Well, that guard is not going to be an NFL player. That guard is going to be a dentist. That guard is going to be a paralegal. That guard is going to be a registered nurse. That, that, that guy's not going to be in the league. So, you know, you manhandle that guy and push him three yards back into the line of scrimmage. Does that really help you? Does film like that, you know, say to NFL scouts, hey, this guy's going to be a player in the league, or does film like that say to NFL scouts, uh, hey, that guy can really push around my dry cleaner? Because usually it's the latter, uh, okay? Usually it's, uh, hey, that guy goes to the gym a lot, and the guy he's pushing around really doesn't, and 
he's not going to be anywhere near the league. So we got ourselves a, a guy who can contribute on special teams and might be able to hold the jock of one of the guys that's actually playing. But yeah, <laughs> you, you don't know what these guys are going to develop into once they actually have access to good quality film study, good quality coaching, good quality workout facilities, but the bulk of them are going to be washouts in the league. All right, let's just be honest there. So we have center Keith Ishmael out of San Diego State going to Washington. This is another pick that's gone through a couple of different teams. Um, all, all these picks in the fifth round, they're usually just trade fodder. Uh, okay, you have value on these picks because there is potential for people to build up and become decent pros. But for the most part, it's just, hey, let's make the math work on this trade down. Let's make the math work on this trade up. Here, have a fifth and I'll take your seventh. Because neither GM is really thinking like, hey, that's huge and I'm going to need that pick because the player I'm going to get there is going to go somewhere. No. They're filling out roster numbers, okay? Their coach decides, hey, you know what? I want two guards. I want three tackles. Um, in this offseason, we need the roster to shake out where we have four defensive ends and five defensive tackles for my particular um, rotation that I run the defensive front seven at. So I better have uh, two tackles and a, uh, an end come out of this draft. So here's where they shore up those numbers. Early in the draft, it's, man, this guy's going to be a damn good pro. The first two, three rounds, it's, I I've got a feeling that this guy is going to start and he's going to be phenomenal. Once you get to like the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round, it's, okay, well, we need a guard. This is the highest rated one we had. So let's, you know, throw it at him and see what's going on. Um, draft strategy changes quite a bit as you get late in the draft. So Keith Ishmael as a center, uh, fifth round, you know, you, you tend to get the middle offensive lineman going in the later rounds like this. Um, this just tells me that Washington feels like they need more depth on their offensive line. Um, that makes sense because Ron Rivera has been a build from the line kind of guy. But yeah, Keith Ishmael, he, he's not anything special. Okay, San Diego State is a decent school. Um, they have produced some NFL talent, but not top-tier NFL talent. They've produced depth players, and that's really all they're getting. So Daniel Thomas, safety out of Auburn, has gone number 12 to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Jacksonville got this pick through Baltimore. It was originally Atlanta's selection. Um, Daniel Thomas, I have watched a little bit of film on because you, you have to watch a lot of Auburn film this year. Um, if you were going to do any research on Derek Brown, you had to watch all the defensive snaps for Auburn. So I've actually seen Daniel Thomas's name come up a decent amount. Um, but he's been a mop up guy. Uh, okay. He, he's not the kind of guy who popped off the film. He, he did not. Blitz extremely well. He did not cover extremely well. He did not um, just pop on tackles where he's separating the ball from receivers all the time. He, he, he didn't produce those kind of highlight plays. All those highlight plays were reserved for the defensive line. Auburn's defensive line was phenomenal. And they had a very good corner in Noah Igbenogany as well. So Daniel Thomas was mostly mop-up duty. Was he good at mop-up duty? Absolutely. Can he do more than mop-up duty? Maybe. Um, but that's not what he's put on film. He's not top-end speed, you know, perfect height, weight, speed guy. He's not elite in coverage ability. He's a, a guy who has done things. That's the best I could really say about him. Um, the Jets are on the clock, picking number 13, uh, number 153 overall. One of the few teams that have actually just kept their own pick in the fifth round because there's so many of these things traded. Um, 
we'll get into that in a second when the selections actually made official. Um, but I want to talk about what teams have been highly effective in this draft overall. I think in spite of not having a first round pick, both the uh, Buffalo Bills and Pittsburgh Steelers have done extremely well in this draft. Um, I've got some head scratcher moves out of the Green Bay Packers. Um, they've not necessarily addressed a hell of a lot of their needs with the early picks. I feel like all their early picks were really luxury situations where they were going after players they may have really liked, but they definitely didn't address immediate needs on the team. So that's got to frustrate Aaron Rodgers beyond just the Jordan Love pick to know that you didn't get an offensive tackle, to know that you didn't get that speed receiver. Um, I would be upset as Aaron Rodgers right now, because it seems like the front office is preparing for his retirement more than they're preparing to win this next few years. So here we are. Jaguars pick is in. Oh, Daniel Thomas, we've already. <laughs> Funny. Jets are still picking. Pick is in. We're just waiting for them to actually announce it here. Um, I, I've always hated this. Like when the pick is in, just get the information out there to people. It, it makes no fucking sense how long we are waiting the past couple of days. Like you'd see, oh, hey, the pick is in, but here's this Lexus commercial. Yeah, that, that, that's my favorite part of the fucking coverage, right? So I, I like the Pittsburgh Steelers and Buffalo Bills drafts. I like um, the Dallas Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys have been extremely effective in this draft um, through all rounds, not only addressing some need, but strengthening positions that are already very strong on their team. C.D. Lamb, you did not peg them as a team that needed to get one of the top wide receivers in this draft. They already have one of the best receivers in the league in Amari Cooper, who did fantastic things for that offense. But now adding C.D. Lamb to that, that, that offense is scary. Scary. So I really like what Dallas has done in this draft. Um, I've got some questions about what Denver's done in the draft. So they're very obviously doing the same thing they did uh, when they won the Super Bowl. Um, they're looking at the team that beat the hell out of them and saying, what does their team look like? Let me make my team look like that. So they lost in the Super Bowl to Seattle. That offseason, they turned around and made a bully. They, they made a defensive bully. And they won the Super Bowl because of it. You know, they got beat up by a very, very tough defense and decided, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to build a very tough defense. They just happened to also have Peyton Manning at the helm at the end of his career. Not necessarily the most physically talented at the time, but his brain won them games in the playoffs and in the Super Bowl. So what's going on there now? They're getting their ass kicked by the Kansas City Chiefs. They're getting run over by the Raiders. And those are more open offenses, especially the Chiefs. They've got speed all over the field. And it's a matter of who the hell do you cover? You know, you got Tyreek Hill. You also got Robinson and you've got Sammy Watkins, who are 4-4 speed guys. So, yeah, you, you got to make sure you got over-the-top coverage for Hill. But then who the fuck is covering Watkins? Who the fuck is covering Robinson? You know, your, your third or fourth corner cannot deal with those guys. So, eventually, you're going to have a matchup nightmare because of a speed demon wide receiver that you couldn't deal with without double or triple teaming him making openings for the other fast receivers down, you know, the, the, the row for the chiefs. That, that's how the chiefs are blowing people out right now. Um, they're just stacked at wide receiver. So that's, I guess what the Broncos wanted to do. They already had Cortland Sutton, a, a true number one receiver. They already have Noah Fant, a good tight end. So to this point, 
they have drafted two more wide receivers and another tight end. <laughs> um, all speedy guys. So they're very obviously mirroring what is beating the hell out of them. They're very obviously saying, okay, the Chiefs are whooping our ass in the regular season. We can't even get into the playoffs because we got to play these guys twice. What the hell are they doing to us? So we can start doing that to the other teams. Uh, Elway's done it before. So I, I think he does a very good job of keeping up with the trends of the league that work against him and mirroring that and trying to emulate it at the very least um, with what he's doing with his personnel decisions. They are drafting a team that's extremely, extremely fast. All right. So here we are getting slowly deeper in the fifth round. A, a couple of these picks have actually run through. Bryce Hall, the corner out of Virginia. I was wondering when the hell this dude was going to go. Because seriously, I was expecting Bryce Hall to go in the fourth. Um, I honestly see the Virginia corner being somebody who could um, contribute uh, as an edge defend corner or a, uh, a nickel or dime interior coverage corner. He's going to have... Um, he's going to have a solid career because he's got positional flexibility. He can play defensive back at any of the defensive back positions that are going to be available to him. Um, the inside of the field, the, the nickel, the slot corner, that's a difficult position. You have a little bit more to worry about than the edge defense corner, but the edge defense corner is more physically demanding. And he's got all the tools to really deal with all of that. Again, I was expecting him to go to the last round. So the Jets picking him up kind of pisses me off because I'm kind of happy with the Jets draft. And as a Bills fan, I don't want them to draft well. Um, I was really uh, excited for Denzel Mims, where he was going to go, until I saw he went to the fucking Jets. Uh, I, yeah, I don't like that the Jets are having a good draft right now at all. Um, they've got a younger running back. They've got a top flight wide receiver. They've got themselves a tackle that can actually protect um, Sam Darnold and open up some running lanes for Le'Veon Bell. They've got Le'Veon Bell's replacement. And now they have a solid corner that I thought was going to, again, be drafted last round. So they're getting very good value and good talent at a position that they definitely needed. Um, yeah, the Patriots selected a kicker. Whew. So we got the first kicker off the board. Uh, comes in the fifth round. Uh, kicker out of Marshall. Uh, Justin Rohrwasher. I don't know crap about him because I'm sorry I don't scout kickers. Um, these guys typically don't need to be drafted ever. So I, I still get a smile on my face thinking about how Sebastian Janikowski was drafted 17th overall. But um, yeah, you can find kickers in free agency, you can find kickers undrafted um, that are going to work. You can find kickers from Australian rules football. Um, there's a lot of different places you can find a kicker. So picking one in the fifth round, they had to really fucking love this guy. Oh, okay, this is very high draft capital to use on a kicker. So I have to only assume that Justin Rohrwasher out of Marshall has had himself an extremely good college career. So further down, we have Nick Harris, the Washington product center uh, going to Cleveland. They have need to address their offensive line. They've got bad depth there and they haven't been providing the best coverage to Baker Mayfield or opening up extremely good running holes for Nick Chubb. These guys have been doing it more so out of their own very talented ways. So creating depth and possibly starter um, competition on that offensive line is a wise move. You have the wide receiver out of Minnesota, Tyler Johnson, going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. A lot of the wide receivers going late would have gone earlier. A lot of them. Tyler Johnson's one of them. Uh, this guy is most years, like a third or fourth round pick. Um, 
he's got all the physical tools. He does not have a lot of good stuff on tape as far as route running or other technique issues at wide receiver because he just hasn't been in a program where you get more solid coaching. So it's going to be a project situation for Tampa Bay, but he doesn't have to do anything right away. Uh, Okay. You've got Mike Evans there. You know, you've got very, very strong wide receiver talent on that team already. So he's obviously going to be a depth player. And if he can't contribute on special teams, he's likely not going to make the team. Um, Getting into Washington at pick number 17. And, man, we got a few picks to go before my Buffalo Bills go. Yeah. Washington's pick is in linebacker out of Michigan, uh, Kalike Hudson. That's interesting. Um, So Kalike Hudson's not a bad player. Um, I had to watch him a decent amount because of scouting Josh Uche. And his name kept coming up. He's a solid tackler. He he has been used in blitz packages. Um, Michigan does some interesting things with their defense, dropping um, rushers into coverage. So there's a lot of odd uh, zone blitzing schemes that he's actually familiar with already. Um, Michigan having a former NFL coach as their head coach, they have one of the more pro style defenses in college football. So I would expect Mr. Hudson to actually have, um, not a steep learning curve going into Washington because Ron Rivera's defense is actually a little more simple than some of the other defenses around the league. It it relies on coaching up the basics and having good fundamentals. So Hudson might actually even be coming from a more complicated defense than what he's going to. So that's a very interesting situation. I, I think Washington did well for themselves there. Linebacker is a position similar to running back where the, the talent is uh, out there. There's a lot, and it's devalued because of it. So fourth and fifth round linebackers can, with time, develop into starters that are extremely, extremely effective. Matt Milano um, is a player like that for the Bills. They um, they got him like the fourth or fifth round out of Boise, and he's been fantastic. So he, he's a solid starter for them. So I would actually expect Mr. Hudson to end up being a solid starter with a decent career for a number of years for Washington. So that's a solid pick right there. The Bears are on the clock with the Eagles to follow. And the Bears actually have retained their own pick here, which is, again, is quite odd. At this point, most of the... um, most of the league is dealing with traded picks. And all of these picks are just trade fodder in general. I don't have a hell of a lot of information on the guys getting drafted because a hell of a lot of them aren't in normal draft guides. As early as the third round, we started coming across players that um, weren't labeled in draft guides and GMs around the league have been putting out there that this is actually one of the most inaccurate uh, mock draft years that they've seen in a very long time. GMs around the league have been saying, look, uh, everybody's mock drafting this guy in like the second or third round. He's just nowhere near there or They're not even looking at players that we're looking at as third or fourth round talents. And we're seeing that come up. So, you know, the best example I can give, it would be Justin Rohrwasher because really nobody expected a kicker to go this early. Um, But there's also Jason Strobridge. You know, a defensive end out of North Carolina that the Dolphins took. Nobody was on that dude. 
at this point in the draft. So there's plenty of people that are getting taken here in the fifth round that, uh, I mean, I've done film study on hundreds of players this past year. Uh, I've seen already probably, oh, 30 or so guys go that I, I, I've got no film on. So draft guides uh, that are out there from sources like Pro Football Focus or the Draft Network or um, you know a- a- any source like that, they don't have current NFL scouts working for them. They're doing it on their own. I'm doing it on my own. So the difference between who I'm scouting and looking at and who the NFL teams are scouting and looking at is coming up. Now, the funny thing about this is the people that scout on their own are just as frequently right as the people that scout professionally and just as frequently wrong. This is really a crapshoot. Drafting is an art. There are a handful of teams, there are a handful of scouts, a handful of GMs that do it extremely, extremely, extremely well. They know what they're looking for in a person. Okay, it's much more than just judging how these guys have been able to affect the play on the field. It's just as much... Um, what are these guys like between the ears? You know, um, what do they have that they're taking care of at home? What do they have in their life that interests them? What do they have that drives them to be a better person or a better player? And that's what these teams are really missing this year. So the reason the draft guides are so in horribly inaccurate is the pre-draft process has been so different this year. So we don't know the players that teams wanted to bring in on an interview. We don't. Because nobody got to bring players in on interviews. Uh, Private workouts. We don't know how teams saw these players doing in private workouts. So we didn't know the players that were going to drop terribly. And those players didn't necessarily drop like they would have before. So a lot of the bigger school guys that would have just fallen off the map and never did because they still have their game film helping them out and they didn't have any of those bad workouts and bad interviews that would have normally dropped them. So um, let's see. When the Broncos drafted, oh, who is that crappy quarterback that they had forever? Uh, As a Memphis product, they drafted a first round quarterback a few years ago and all of the teams that brought him in on an interview took him off of their draft board, took him off. There's a guy that went in the first round and every team that he interviewed with, he was not even a consideration for drafting because of his interview. And he ends up being a first round draft pick for Denver. So the interview process matters a hell of a lot. If you don't actually get face-to-face time with these players, you can't really pick their brain. You can't know what they're all about. And knowing what they're all about, knowing some basics of what you think they're going to spend their money on once they make this big contract, the the most money that they've ever had in their lives, for the most part. Um, Not everybody's Antoine Winfield Jr. and has an NFL player dad. So most of these players, this is the most money they've ever even freaking seen when they get drafted. You have to have an idea of what these guys are going to do with that money. And you never had that drop off. So you never had the meteoric rise of, you know, half a dozen different no-names into the first and second round, which typically does happen. 
And we typically follow that process and know who's interviewing who, who we think is doing well in interviews, who's doing poorly in interviews. And we're able to gauge what the draft is going to look like from that and to, to infer what these teams are viewing from these players. So, yeah. Uh, so Nick Harris, Washington Center, who knows? He, he might have been drafted higher than he was. But he's here in the fifth round because the big school guys are dominating the early rounds. Now they're mostly gone at this point. So now we're getting these small school guys. And, and that's why it's interesting to me, players like Kalika Hudson from Michigan dropping this far, because I would think he would benefit from the school he's in. So maybe this just tells me that the NFL teams might have had him down in the freaking seventh round. But because he's playing for a big school and it is this year's draft, he's just got better access and he ends up going in the fifth round here. So. Hmm. After Kalika Hudson, we have the Bears at 18 picked uh, Kindle uh, Vildor corner out of Georgia Southern. They're definitely building up their defense there. This is now the second corner that I've seen going to them. They picked up Jalen Johnson earlier in the draft. Uh, Jalen Johnson is a guy that's going to compete for uh, starts and likely end up being the starting outside corner at that team. But um, Kendall Vidler here is going to be a special teams guy in depth. He's probably going to be your fourth corner. And uh, you know, dime package does see some time, so he'll he'll get field time, but he, he's more drafted for depth and uh, for special teams play than anything. You have Curtis Weaver, edge rusher out of Boise State, finally going. So Curtis Weaver out of Boise State is an edge rusher that a lot of people actually had um, going in the second round. So Curtis Weaver is the um, he's actually the conference record holder for career sacks, but he plays for Boise State. So the worry with him was always what is the level of his competition? Because he's not a freakish athlete. He just, you know, hustled. He's got a great motor. He's not chiseled. He's not extremely fast. He, he's just the kind of guy who works for what he gets. So I actually expected him and many expected him to go far higher in the draft. But again, small school. And the small school guys have been pushed down the board considerably. So Curtis Weaver out of Boise State here it is somebody that the Dolphins might have picked up that is going to have an immediate effect. He's a guy who might end up being an extremely good pro. But because the draft this year is what it is, he dropped this far down the board. Again, people do not like his athleticism, but you cannot deny his production. And I've always wondered why NFL teams you know, you hear coaches talk about, oh, that guy's just a good football player, things like that. Why do they get enamored with physicality in the draft process when it doesn't always translate to how well you play football? How, how many bench press reps you can put up doesn't necessarily mean you know how to deal with the leverage points on another human being to move him out of your way. It doesn't. It helps. It helps a lot. But it's not the be-all, end-all. If you know how to deal with leverage, you can make it easier. So you don't necessarily need to be as strong to have good playing strength. So... I think Curtis Weaver is going to have himself a solid career. I do. I watched enough film on him to know that he works very hard for what he gets. And you do not become the career leader in sacks in any college division 
without having some amount of talent that can translate to the NFL. You, it just, it doesn't happen like that. So I think that he is a diamond in the rough here. I, I think that Curtis Weaver is a guy that's going to end up being very good for the Dolphins. Moving on now, we have Colin Johnson, wide receiver out of Texas, selected by Jacksonville. Colin Johnson is another one. Colin Johnson is a guy that a lot of people had going in the third round. Um, Texas had a pretty good receiving core. They didn't necessarily have the best quarterback. So these players are a bit devalued. They don't have the statistical uh, showing that, say, like the Jerry Judys or the um, Justin Jeffersons of the world do. But Colin Johnson is a solid player. He's a good height, weight, speed mix. Uh, for wide receiver, um, this guy, yeah, he, he's six foot six, six foot six, <laughs> two hundred and twenty pounds. Um, he, he's going to be, I think, solid depth. He's going to contribute right away on special teams. Um, you could use him as a gunner. He's got the body for it, but. I think Colin Johnson is going to be a solid receiver in this league. So he's probably going to be sliding into like the third or fourth receiver spot um, day one with chance to build. So I really like Colin Johnson. I think that's a solid pick for Jacksonville. Uh, so Quintez Cephas, wide receiver out of Wisconsin, uh, goes to Detroit. I don't have a lot on Quintez, unfortunately. Um, Wisconsin, I watched mostly for Jonathan Taylor uh, because he was most of their offense. So Cephas didn't really get a lot of play. Now, he, he was successful when he made catches, sure, but that offense relied entirely on Jonathan Taylor. So he didn't get a hell of a lot of use. He's six foot one, two hundred and two pound junior. Um, ran a terrible forty time at four seven, and uh, yeah, again, does not have a lot of film and a lot of use um, at the Wisconsin wide receiver position that he was at. So, uh, the Bills, my Buffalo Bills, just drafted quarterback Jake Fromm. Yeah. I thought this guy was useless. Um, there are a lot of people that think Jake Fromm could potentially build into being a solid pro. I am not one of them. I don't think Jake Fromm is going to do shit in this league. So I think that's a throwaway pick. I don't like it. I, I don't like the Bills drafting Jake Fromm. I think that they already had backup quarterback short up with my, Matt Barkley. And do you really need three quarterbacks in the room? You have your guy in Josh Allen. So, yeah, I, I just think Jake Fromm's a wasted pick. The Georgia product, um, you know, Mel Kuyper, amongst others, had him as a second or third round talent. I didn't. I had him as, you know, in this range, uh, fifth round guy. And that's where he got drafted. But I just don't like he, that he got drafted by my Buffalo Bills. I, I think that they could have done more to address um, other positions. But of course, it, it is a well built roster. So pretty much everybody getting drafted this year is going to have a hard time really carving out a niche on the team. Um, so they're probably taking that into account and just drafting the best player on their board. And it makes sense with where he was drafted that he's definitely the biggest name and most known person outside of maybe Curtis Weaver in the fifth round to this point. Uh, I, Bryce Hall is another one. So the fifth round guys, you know, Shane Lemieux. Yeah, so there's only a few name 
um, obvious players that have been drafted in the fifth round, and Fromm is definitely one of them. Um, but again, I just don't see the need to draft a quarterback at that position with who they already have on the roster. Hmm. So John Hightower, wide receiver out of Boise State, going to Philadelphia. Boise State, again, you worry about competition level. It's the same reason that Curtis Weaver fell as much as he did. I'm oddly surprised that out of all the Boise State players that have gone, the one that really didn't seem hurt by this pre-draft process much was Ezra Cleveland. Ezra Cleveland going in the second round at tackle when really at the time he went, I thought there was probably two or three tackles better than him. You still had Josh Jones on the board at that point. Um, I don't understand why Ezra Cleveland's draft position did not get hurt, but Curtis Weaver's most certainly did. But again, uh, Boise State, uh, Jonathan Hightower going to uh, um, the Philadelphia Eagles wide receiver is six foot one, 189 pounds. So pretty small. Um, well, I should say light for his height as a professional athlete, uh, kind of a scrawny guy, but running a four, four speed, um, the Eagles have needed to address receiver in this draft. They needed both starters and depth. And they they drafted, you know, starter. They got Jalen Regor, um, who's very much like Hightower here, built uh, a little bit slight and very much in the Deshaun Jackson mold. Uh, but they also spent a higher pick on Jalen Hurts. So there's a couple of quarterbacks in the league right now wondering what the fuck their team's doing. Uh, Aaron Rodgers and Carson Wentz have probably got to be calling each other, seeing, uh, oh, oh, comparing notes. Like, no, oh, did your team tell you they were going to do this before that? Oh, oh, they did? No, mine didn't. Yeah. Um, Aaron Rodgers has got to be pissed. I'd be pissed if I was Carson Wentz. Um, I can understand the positions of the team in both situations. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is retiring soon. You know, he's got maybe two, three years left at the most. So maybe start having him groom his replacement like he was groomed by Brett Favre. Makes sense. Carson Wentz gets hurt all the damn time. So, you know, since you had to win a Super Bowl with Nick Foles, maybe having a very good backup is a good idea. So Jalen Hurts here. He might end up being trade fodder at some point, too. But um, the Eagles addressing wide receiver throughout the draft makes a lot of sense and has to soften the blow a little bit that Jalen Hurts was drafted for Carson Wentz. Um, Harrison Hand, corner out of Temple, just got drafted by Minnesota. Now, they needed to address defensive back. And, and they have uh, throughout this draft. Not only is this Temple product, but earlier in the draft, they picked up Jeff Gladney, who I thought was a perfect fit for their defense. Uh, they lost a couple of corners this offseason. Um, between Rhodes and, uh, oh, what's a So it's a T. I forget the guy's name now. But they, they've lost both starting corners from their defense. So they definitely needed to address the position. Considering Gladney earlier, this guy now, um, 5'11", 197, so standard height and weight for a corner. He's not the fastest guy. He runs a 4'5". Typically, you want them in the 4'4 four four, uh, range, but 4'5 isn't a slug by any sense. Um, he's likely going to end up being... I mean, he's got the build for a solid outside corner, but he doesn't necessarily have the speed. So he's probably going to end up fitting at a nickel slot. Ravens are on the clock, uh, followed by the Texans and Lions coming up. Ravens have had themselves a very good offseason. 
not only are they drafting well, but the free agency acquisitions that they had previous to this are outstanding. I, I think that the Ravens having a draft where you know they get a solid running back, they get a solid wide receiver, um, they get a solid linebacker, and they're off season revamping the defensive line um, via free agency, adding some defensive line depth to that as well in this draft. I, I think they're doing well. Uh, okay. I really liked the Matabuke pick. Um, I thought that he was valued higher than where they got him. Um, I like the Dobbins pick. J.K. Dobbins is going to be one of the better running backs out of this draft. And... Yeah, who was it in the first? Was it uh, Patrick Queen? Yeah. So they pick up Patrick Queen, a pick after uh, Seattle picked up Brooks, who I thought was more of a second round talent. So they're taking advantage of their draft position. They're getting good value at the positions that they're drafting. And you combine that with the free agency period that they had. I think Baltimore is having one of the better off seasons in general. So here their pick is in Broderick Washington, Texas Tech defensive tackle. I like Broderick Washington. I thought he was quite effective. And actually, I thought he was more the reason that Brooks was even viewed as a draftable talent. So when you're looking at linebacker, you're always wondering if they're effective because the defensive line in front of them has been more effective. And that I thought was the case here at Texas Tech. And I thought Brooks did himself a damn good job on that defensive front. He plays with power really well and takes on double teams relatively frequently. Uh, he's a starter for three years. And we're looking at a guy who's 6'2", 300 plus pounds. And, and again, you can tell the damage done to this team by losing to Tennessee the way they did. They have addressed the defensive line so much. Like they are so afraid of coming across Derrick Henry again that they went out and they got themselves five new defensive linemen. Yeah, I, I think that's freaking hilarious. Um, Houston's on the clock. Let's talk a little bit about what Houston's done this offseason, shall we? Um, you have to include, of course, last offseason. This is uh, a coach who has now taken on GM responsibilities, traded away some of the best talent the team had. Um, Hopkins and uh, Tyron Matthew and Jadavian Clowney all allowed to leave. And, you know, Matthew went. Uh, I believe via free agency, but Clowney and Hopkins, you didn't get first round picks for those players. And you're giving up multiple first round picks for the players that you acquired. Laramie Tunsil, you had to give up two first round picks to get Laramie Tunsil. Um, I, I just think that, I think that um, the coach there in Houston is drinking too much of his own Kool-Aid or something because he's not been effective the past few off seasons with building this roster. If it was not for the presence of Deshaun Watson, I think this team would really be struggling. Uh, Watson, you have a good mobile quarterback that spackles over a lot of holes in your walls. And, They've never really provided him with an effective offensive line. And, ooh, I understand Laramie Tunsil was part of what was supposed to do that. But the line's still a problem. And run support, running the running game, they, they're supposedly addressing that with Calvin Johnson. I'm sorry, not Calvin Johnson. Um, so Johnson, David Johnson, um, that they got from the Cardinals in the trade with uh, DeAndre Hopkins. So you traded one of the best wide receivers in the league away 
for a running back who's making way too much fucking money and been injured the past few years. I I don't see the logic behind it. I don't. Um, they've had a decent draft. They um, picked up Ross Blacklock earlier in the draft, who I think is going to really help uh, J.J. Watt. And here they picked up, let's see, Isaiah Coulter, wide receiver out of Rhode Island. Let's look into him a little bit. We have six foot two, two hundred pound, four four guy uh, playing at oh, let's see, playing at Rhode Island. You're really not going to have the opportunity to gauge him against solid NFL talent. So his statistical backlog doesn't necessarily matter. It, it's a player that you really needed an opportunity to work out. That's a player you really needed in an opportunity to interview. So Isaiah Coulter is adding to the depth of the wide receiver group for Houston. Something they needed to do, considering they did just get rid of DeAndre Hopkins. Um, I understand you pick up Brandon Cooks, but Brandon Cooks is regularly hurt. And you, you can't replace a guy like... DeAndre Hopkins with a guy who gets injured all the time because Hopkins, he was just Mr. Reliable. And you have your other wide receiver, Will Fuller, who's regularly hurt. So depth wide receivers like Mr. Coulter here might end up seeing a good amount of playing time because all three top end wide receivers for Houston uh, Will Fuller, Brandon Cooks, and Kiki Kuti all have real injury history in the league where they haven't been able to consistently play out seasons. So I would expect Mr. Coulter here to see a significant amount of playing time in Houston because I just do not trust Will Fuller to stay healthy. I do not trust Brandon Cooks to stay healthy. Kiki Kuti's got one significant injury in you know, one significant year of playing time. So it remains to be seen if it's a pattern for him, but so far it's what he's got, injury history. Now the Lions have just made a selection. They picked running back out of New Mexico State, Jason Huntley. Huntley is, let's see, 5'9", 200 pounds, so essentially the ideal size for a running back. He's, well, another small school guy, but at that height and speed, with the production level that he's had in college, you would expect him to be, you know, depth player. And I just don't understand the number of running backs taken for Detroit. This is now the second running back that they've taken. Do they think Kerryon Johnson's done? Because Kerryon Johnson had an injury issue last year. Uh, do they think Johnson is no more? Do they not like Bo Scarborough, who replaced Johnson in the lineup after Johnson went down with injury? Um, do they think that he's a bum? I mean, he is, but drafting two running backs tells me you don't have faith in your starter or your depth. So that's very interesting in Detroit. With the talent they already had in the running back room, putting two more running backs in there, it it only makes sense if you're moving on from people. It, it only makes sense if you have no faith in your starting running back to draft two running backs. I don't know what's going on in Detroit, man. They had a lot of needs on defense. And to go with now a second running back uh, in Jason Huntley, that's got to tell Kerryon Johnson that his days are numbered. That they have no faith in him any longer. And they're going a different direction. Um, it was bad enough that they just picked up DeAndre Swift. But now adding this guy, 
they're definitely moving running backs away from that team. And it's not just going to be Bo Scarborough. Um, so the Bears are picking next. It's interesting having a draft when you don't have a first round pick. Uh, the Bears picked up wide receiver Daryl Mooney out of Tulane. Now, Mooney, 5'10, 176. So he's a real scrawny guy, but he runs a 4'3. So you're looking at that Santana Moss, Deshaun Jackson kind of mold of player as a possibility. Um, he played for Tulane. It's not a D1 school. So you worry about his level of competition. So you can kind of throw his tape out. He should dominate his competition at Tulane if he's going to be an NFL player. Um, Mooney as a speed demon is so the offensive strategies from Chicago came from the Kansas City um, Andy Reid situation. That's where their head coach um, came up. So they're probably trying to emulate the depth at wide receiver that you have down there in Kansas City. And the speed matters so much. Um, I don't necessarily like, um, the tight end pick that they had earlier in the draft. I do appreciate Jalen Johnson quite a bit. Um, I think he's going to work well with that defense. I think he would have worked better with that defense had they still had Fangio, but uh, I do think Jalen Johnson is going to do well. So this is a bit of an up and down draft for me, for the bears. And anytime you have no number one pick. It's much harder to have a better draft, but it can be done. And, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of question marks surrounding the front office of the Bears. Um, and a lot of them are based off of Mitchell Trubisky. And what the hell are they going to do with that guy? Um, I don't understand why they're not trying to push him out or spur him along. And you have teams like Philly drafting Jalen Hurts in the second round. Uh, showing their boy Carson Wentz like, hey, you, you get hurt too many more times. We got your replacement right here. Um, they're not doing that in Chicago. But they should be. They really should be. All right. So... Tennessee has made their pick. Defensive tackle out of North Carolina State, uh, Laryl Merchison. Now, I can honestly say I did not watch any tape on this guy. Um, as I stated earlier, I I've watched tape on hundreds of players this year. And this draft is proving the difference between draft analysis and uh, scouting departments. There's a huge gap. And it's not necessarily a gap between, you know, these guys can actually break down film and these guys can't. No. It's a gap of who they're actually looking at as possibilities. Because NFL teams get these players wrong all the fucking time. And draft analysts who are clamoring for a particular player to be drafted earlier than he was are actually right all the fucking time. So, you know, me saying, I don't know why the hell Curtis Weaver lasted to the fifth round. Just watch Curtis Weaver for me. All right. He, he's going to do pretty well um, for the Dolphins. And, and I'm kind of sad that they're the team that got him. Because again, as a Bills fan, um, the Jets and the Dolphins and the Patriots all having really good drafts this year is kind of pissing me off. Um, but yeah, Laryl Merchison, I've got nothing on. I, I, I apologize. But this deep in the draft, uh, you're going to get that a lot. You're going to get a lot of people who don't have any workup on them in the draft guides. You're going to have a lot of people who nobody's watched any film on. Um, it, it happens, and it happened in this draft as early as the third round for me. Um, as early as the third round, people that weren't even listed in draft guides we're going. Um, hi, Minty Reacts. 
How you doing? Um, thanks for commenting. Who's your team? And do you like the draft that they've had so far? Here we've got Green Bay. Just drafted linebacker out of Minnesota, Kamal Martin. Green Bay has had an interesting draft. Uh, man, the Jordan Love pick is going to be talked about for years until he's actually starting. Um, until Jordan Love has... Oh, sorry, I glitched. What did you say? I, I said, who is your team? And do you like the draft that they've been having so far? Um, but yeah, we've got... Oh, Green Bay's had an interesting one. They really have. Um, a tight end drafted um, and a quarterback drafted. And they had real needs at wide receiver and tackle that they didn't address. So, yeah, no, I... Oh, there you go. Giants fan. Okay. No, I really like what the Giants have done this year uh, as well. I, I like the offensive lineman you picked up out of Oregon. Uh, just last pick, I want to say for you guys. Um, Oregon had one of the better offensive lines in college football. So I think that you have a potential starting guard there in Lemieux. And coupling that with Andrew Thomas earlier in the draft, I think you finally have some protection in front of uh, Saquon Barkley and um, Daniel Jones that they've desperately needed there for a couple of years. So addressing that offensive line, I think you're doing really well with it. Actually, I think there's a couple of good drafts in a row. So they're building there in New York and watching Washington flounder as much as they have and the Eagles Drafting a backup quarterback as high as they had to has really got to be exciting for you. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Lemieux going to center, that, that would help your offensive line more than a guard would for sure. Um, anytime you can get a young center paired up with a young quarterback so they can develop over time together, that, that's a huge benefit for a quarterback. So I, I do like that idea for sure. All right. So Minnesota's just drafted KJ Osborne, wide receiver out of Miami. So this guy's 5'11, 203, ran a 4'4. Actually, he's one of the guys who has a full combine workout together. That, that's kind of rare looking through this. So many of the wide receivers like only benched or only ran the 40, and that's it. So seeing a guy that has a full workup of a combine workout here is kind of strange. Um, a lot of the workouts got truncated this year, and uh, yeah. All right, so Osborne is probably just going to be a depth player uh, for Minnesota. They've got too much wide receiver talent there already. So I'm not anticipating Osborne to do a damn thing except for play on special teams. Um, but you never know. Uh, having traded away Stefan Diggs, um, I understand they had a first round draft pick uh, wide receiver, but you never know with these later round picks. Uh, once they finally get access to quality coaching and quality uh, workout facilities, um, a different way of analyzing defenses and film study, treating it like a job instead of like a game. Um, once they have all those changes in their lives for football, a lot of these later round picks actually do develop into extremely good pros. That's what happened with Stefan Diggs. Stefan Diggs was like a fourth or fifth round pick. So they got a first round pick for him and they used that first round pick to uh, select um, Dustin Jefferson. But who's to say this KJ Osborne guy might not actually develop better. So it, it, that's why it, these later rounds are always really interesting to me. I, I like to know where they ended up picking up people. Um, and this draft in particular is much more interesting to me than previous drafts because 
we did not know who was being pulled in for interviews on any of these teams. And when you don't know that, you know, everybody's mock drafts are so far off, it's ridiculous. So, you know, all of these scouting departments are cloistered, you know, in, in themselves. Um, you know, the, the Bills, the, the Vikings, the, the Bears, the, the freaking Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they have their own scouting departments. They don't rely on any information from sources like ESPN or NFL Network or anything of that nature. In fact, ESPN and NFL Network are getting their information from these scouts that the reporters are taking out to lunch. Um, so you have groups of people making their own decisions on these players. And they no longer have the ability to take them in for personal workouts. Now, uh, let's see. I definitely, I can never decide what round players who get draft start to actually end up in the bench or even get cut. Yeah. So um, the typical rule is the first three rounds are where you want to get your starters. Uh, they're where you want to get your starters and your high quality depth rotational players that end up getting a lot of percentage of uh, snaps. But that's not necessarily where they all end up coming from. Um, all the time, there's first round and second round and third round busts that just never do a damn thing on your team. And you get a, like a fifth or a seventh round guy or an undrafted guy who ends up being a starter on your team. Um, I'm, again, always very, very interested in the draft, but also the post-draft process where the undrafted players are going. Um, back in the day, the Bills uh, took Jason Peters, who was a tight end in college. He was an undrafted free agent. He made the team. They got him to gain weight and they converted him to tackle. And by the end of his uh, first four years in the league, which were all with Buffalo, he was an all pro left tackle and one of, if not the best left tackles in the game. And then he goes on to sign his big contract and do most of the rest of his career with Philadelphia. And he's a free agent right now. And nobody's picked him up yet because he's over the hill, but um, he started out as a damn college tight end and didn't actually find his natural position until the pro game. So there's plenty of people like that. All right. So we, we've gone through a couple of picks here now. Um, 32, uh, Michael Dana, edge out of Michigan, went to the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, this guy is 6'2", 261, does not have a full workout listed. Um, Michigan is a good program, but much like the other Michigan players, um, he, he's worked in a pro-style defense. You worry about a defensive end's production when the end on the opposite side was so very productive. So was he just getting to the quarterback and putting up the stats that he was because he had Josh Uche on the opposite side? Um, Uche is a, a definite talent that's going to be extremely good in the league and going to be useful as... I thought of Uche as more of like a 3-4 outside linebacker where he could rush the passer and drop into coverage. A lot of people think of him as an outside linebacker, even in a 4-3. But because of his presence, Michael Dana's um, contributions were lessened in, in my mind. So I can understand why he's going this late. Um, and then right after that, the Wake Forest linebacker, um, Justin Strant? No clue there. Um, as a compensatory pick, it just got drafted by Denver. Now, they've definitely needed linebacker depth in Denver, but because their defensive front is so effective, that kind of lessens the need, uh, but they certainly still need bodies there. Uh, linebacker was a position that I really thought they should have addressed high in the draft last year. Instead, they traded that pick uh, to Pittsburgh, and they ended up picking up the, the good linebacker in the draft, and uh, they traded down and got Noah Fant. It remains to be seen if Noah Fant's going to actually be a viable tight end in the league, but everything's trending up for him. So I can't necessarily say that was a bad decision. Um, 
And here we are with the last pick in the fifth round, uh, Bradley Ane, edge rusher out of Utah, going to the Cowboys. Now, Utah produces a lot of NFL talent. Utah has produced now, let's see, three defensive secondary players got drafted from there, as well as, I want to say, an offensive lineman. So this is the first defensive lineman from Utah that's been drafted. But this is a school that's been producing consistent NFL talent for some time now. Um, So he's going to have the work ethic needed and the professional mindset needed. And as an edge rusher at six foot three, um, that's good for his frame, but he's weighing in at only about 257. So he's a guy that's going to have to put some weight on his frame to consistently produce at the edge at the NFL level. So it remains to be seen if he's going to be as effective athletically at a higher weight in order so he can deal with NFL size offensive tackles, because you're not going up against a six foot six, 300 pound player every down in college out of Utah. You're definitely going to if you're playing for the Cowboys, though. So I like the Cowboys draft so far. I think they've effectively addressed their defensive needs, and they really just flexed that offense so much when they picked up CeeDee Lamb in the first round. They're they're having a very, very good draft. So start of the sixth round, uh, Bengals. Uh, select Hakeem Adenji, guard out of Kansas. Uh, guard is a position where you can still get starters this late in the draft. Um, it, it's not a, a position that is very, very daunting to learn. Um, as a physically dominant player, uh, run blocking it is more of a mindset than a technique thing. So I really like getting guards this late in the draft because there's just going to be a bunch of them that are even going to be able to be starter capable. Um, but this guy is six foot four, 300 pounds, and it is quite an athlete. You, you know, he's strong. He put, put up 34 reps and ran a five second 40 time. So that's an athlete at guard. That is a big, big man to be running that fast. And, and he can jack up weight. So, He's a strong player, and I would expect him to be an effective run blocker right out of the gates. Pass blocking protection schemes are something that guards typically have to learn. Um, Hand placement, leverage, whether or not you're bending at the hips or bending at the knees, these are things that need to be coached and drilled into you at the NFL level. Um, But guards are more important as run blockers than anything. So I would expect him to be effective at the beginning. And, man, the Bengals have needed that. They needed offensive line help really bad. And Joe Burrow has got to be very, very happy that they're addressing the offensive line as well as they have in this draft. So Denver is picking next. And, and again, I, I'm not necessarily sold on Denver's strategy here. Um getting so many wide receivers in this draft instead of addressing the offensive line um, tackle position specifically because Garrett Bowles has just been fucking terrible for them. They, they've gotten to the interior of the offensive line later in the draft here. They did last pick, and here they go again with another guard out of Fresno State. Uh, they picked Untain Muti, 6'3", 315-pound pound. Uh, player and this guy is a monster. Uh, he is strong. Uh, okay, so Muti actually had a higher grade on him from a lot of people. Uh, Muti was um, listed as a possible third rounder from a lot of sources that I was researching. So, yeah, I'm surprised that he went this late. Truly. So you're going to have to excuse me. I'm going to step away for a moment here. I uh, I never got my power cord and the computer is about to die. So I got to run away here for just a moment and I'll be right back.
I'm sorry? So, bucket. All right. So, getting back into the draft conversation here. Again, really, really surprised that Natane Mute out of Fresno State went this late in the draft. As strong of a player as he is, like physically strong, um, and at a guard position, that's the most important thing. That this guy is going to be able to manhandle people. So I think he is going to be an immediate impact in the interior offensive line for the Broncos because they have no offensive linemen. They're, they're terrible on the offensive line. So they've addressed, again, the interior of the offensive line, though. They have not addressed the tackle position. And Garrett Bowles holds people every other play. So... I don't get why they haven't addressed the tackle position yet. The Patriots are picking here, and they've, again, had a very effective draft. So I'm mildly upset about that because the Patriots are in the Bills division, and, well, I never like seeing them do well in any way. Um, yeah. I think that we could all deal with the Patriots just going ahead and uh, falling off into obscurity. But, well, Bill Belichick's too good. That guy is one of the best coaches the league has ever seen. And he's been managing player personnel there as well for his entire time. He's been the man with the final decision. Um, at the beginning of his career there, he had Scott Pioli, who was uh, – also a very strong talent evaluator, um, but they would disagree now and again. And uh, Pioli wanted to have more control. He ended up getting a bit more when he went to Kansas City, but then he gets another coach who likes to have control over personnel and Andy Reid, booting him out of there too. So um, Pioli is now just, I think, working for ESPN. Anyways, um, Patriots just drafted Penn State linebacker Cameron Brown. Um, Cameron Brown did a lot of mop-up duty pretty well. He's a solid tackler. Um, you worry about how much his play was affected by Etor Gross Matos. Uh, Etor Gross Matos was an extremely, extremely effective edge rusher for them and just dominated. And any <laughs> excuse me. Anytime you have a defensive front line player that's that effective, the linebackers become, I don't know, you, you worry about whether or not that linebacker is personally very hardworking and did everything he was able to do on the stat sheet because he worked for it or because he is just getting things funneled towards him and dropping in his lap because people are running away from Igor Gross Matos. Um, he did well at the Combine, 4-7, um, 16 reps. It's kind of average for linebackers. Um, he's six foot five and 230 pounds, and he's got 34-inch arms. So this guy is the size of a solid 3-4 edge-rushing linebacker, um, which is what New England has run. So they've kind of moved back and forth from 4-3 to 3-4 based off of who they have personnel-wise. Um, so I, I just think they're really building their defense quite well through this draft for New England. They're getting people that are the right size, that are coming from programs that have you know, more pro coaching than not. And we're really going to see what Bill Belichick can do without Tom Brady. Because it's not like the year he got hurt. He's just gone. Um, but the year he got hurt, if anybody remembers, it, they did well. They, they won the damn division still. They, they, they had Matt fucking Castle, and they won 12 games. 
So I don't think that they're going to tail off as much as other people do. I really don't. So now... Oh, no, no, Cameron Brown ended up going to the Giants. My apologies. So I ended up skipping over Mike uh, and Wenyu. Michigan guard is what went to the Patriots. So the Michigan guard, uh, when you, I don't have a lot of film on him. I watched Michigan mostly because of their defense. Um, but, you know, Michigan is a school that typically does create a lot of offensive linemen in the league. Um, any of the Northern colleges, offensive linemen um, come pretty tough out of those programs. They focus on recruiting good offensive linemen in um, the Great Lakes area schools like Michigan um, because they need to. They need to rely on the running game more um, since they're in colder climates. So I think he's likely to be effective. And Cameron Brown is just a, a good draft pick for the Giants again. The Giants are having extremely, extremely effective draft. So that's got to be very, very satisfying for uh, Mr. Minty Reacts here, our resident Giants fan. Um, they're building their defense well. They really are. I, I think that Gettleman is a stronger Italian uh, talent evaluator than people give him credit for. He, he's the precursor to my Buffalo Bills GM, um, Brandon Bean. Brandon Bean learned at the hip of Mr. Gettleman, and yes, yeah, it's, it's a good front office. The, the Bills have a very good front office, so I can only assume that the flow of the front office for um, the man he learned under is also quite good. Speaking of former Panthers GMs, um, the Panthers have selected defensive tackle out of Baylor, Bravian Roy. Baylor has produced some decent NFL talent recently. Now, Roy here is six foot one, 330 pounds. So this guy is just a fire plug um, on the defensive line. Um, run stuffer, definitely not a pass rusher. Okay. If he had pass rush talent, um, he would have gone in earlier rounds. Big guys in the middle of the defensive line that can rush the passer are at a premium. So he's really just going to be the I'm going to fight off a couple of blockers and be big kind of player. So he's going to need to play in a scheme that relies on having a big guy eat up blockers. Not all schemes do that anymore. So since he's going to the Panthers, that's helpful. They, they've addressed the defensive line a lot in this draft. You have Derek Brown, um, Caleb on Chase on. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Not Caleb on Chase on. Uh, Etor Gross Matos. So you've got Derek Brown, Etor Gross Matos, and uh, Bravian Roy. Now defensive line additions for the Carolina Panthers. So the Panthers had a terrible run defense last year. Uh, their defensive line did not create pressure on the quarterback. Their defense was overall bad. If they didn't have Christian McCaffrey, um, they wouldn't have won what they did. They didn't win much. So the amount that they're addressing defense in this draft does not surprise me. And I, I think it's a decent draft to do it. And because of the wide receiver depth, people are going after wide out and the defensive talent is moving down the board. Jeremy Chin should not have been available at the position where they were able to draft him. So they're benefiting from people's focus on the skill position players that are available here. Miami has selected Blake Ferguson, a long snapper. Man. Well, it's another LSU player off the board. So LSU has had so many fucking people get drafted. This is now, what, 11 or 12 LSU players drafted this year. Yeah, a couple of their defensive secondary, a couple of their linebackers, an edge rusher, two guards, wide receiver, quarterback, running back, and now a long snapper. So kudos to LSU. Seriously. 
that barely understandable coach that they have there obviously recruits extremely well um, because they have gotten so many NFL players into the league this year. It's nuts. Again, like 11 or 12 LSU players now have been drafted, and that is just unheard of. The Chargers are on the clock here, and they've had a pretty good draft. Um, they were telling people that they were going to be starting Tyrod Taylor, um, which obviously is not the case considering they drafted Justin Herbert. So I felt that they would have been best suited attempting to trade up with the Lions so they could get Tua. Because if there is ever a team that needs a shot in the arm at quarterback, it is the Chargers. And I thought that Tua was the much better prospect than Justin Herbert. It remains to be seen. But here they are in round six, picking safety, Alohi Gilman out of Notre Dame. They don't really have a horrible need at safety, but they've had interesting play in the defensive backfield. A couple of years ago, when they were in the playoffs against the uh, Ravens, they laid the groundwork for this kind of positionless uh, defensive secondary and linebacker core trend that's going right now, where they had all of their defensive backs playing linebacker in order to uh, just have a lot of team speed on the field so they could deal with um, Lamar Jackson and the running game from the Ravens. So adding another safety is interesting. Now, Notre Dame had some serious NFL talent uh, on the team. Uh, Julian Aquara went earlier, and they had another edge rusher uh, go earlier. So they've had a decent program there for some time, and they've recruited really well. So the five foot ten, two hundred pound safety. Uh, this guy ran a four six, and has a decent vertical. Um, he's undersized for safety. He's small. So having that good vertical is going to help him in the league. It's the only way he's going to be effective at um, dealing with a contested catch point. Um, because generally you want like a six one plus safety. So he's a bit small, but Coming out of a Notre Dame program, he's going to be a little bit more pro-ready than out of other programs. Um, I would anticipate him being a special teamer, though. So the Chargers just have a very good defensive secondary. He's not going to be needed. So he's depth and special teams play, and that's really it. The Browns are on the clock. They've had a pretty good draft to this point. I think that the Browns have done effectively what they needed to do in this draft. Now, so far, they have, oh, let's see. I know earlier they selected Jedrick Wills, which I really liked. But um, I'm trying to bring to mind who else they've picked to this point. I just am drawing a blank. But here they pick Donovan Peoples-Jones, wide receiver out of Michigan. Now, Donovan Peoples-Jones, a lot of people actually had as high as the second round. Shows you the depth at wide receiver and shows you the difference in scouting between NFL scouting departments and um, prognosticators on ESPN and such. Um, the Michigan product is quite fast, a uh, bit lanky, and was used on special teams. He ran a 4-4, 40 time. He's six foot two, 212 pounds. Um, he was a do-everything for their offense. 
Okay, they used him in special teams. They used him in multiple different wide receiver positions. He was dangerous after the catch, but it's it's Michigan. He wasn't dangerous after the catch on the level that you got out of the SEC players. Not at all. Um, So you would see the pre-draft process people putting him in the same category in the same range as like Michael Pittman Jr. and Brandon Ayuk. So obviously Brandon Ayuk went much higher. Michael Pittman Jr. went in like, I want to say the second or third round. And here's Donovan Peoples-Jones in the sixth. And again, a lot of people had him as high as the second round. So um, he could potentially work out quite well for Cleveland, but I, I wasn't as high as, on him as others. I, I definitely did not have him in the second round. I put a two round mock draft out and uh, he wasn't in it. Um, but yeah. Yeah. A lot of people liked him. I didn't. Uh, he, he's fast. He's good with the ball in his hands, but he, he doesn't run routes at all. Um, he doesn't run routes. Well, uh, the system he was in in Michigan did have some more pro concepts than a lot of other teams. So he did have the route tree available to him. He just did not run them well. My Buffalo Bills are on the clock again, and I'm mildly upset at them for drafting Jake Fromm. We'll, uh, we'll give them a pass because their second and third round picks were spectacular in uh, A.J. Epinesa and Zach Moss. But, yeah, Jake Fromm. And, and the wide receiver they picked up in the fourth round. Um, wasn't even in draft guides. So last two picks have been a bit questionable from the Bills. Mm. Come on. Come on. Pick's been in forever. You just have to actually freaking lay out what it is. Zach Moss, I'm extremely excited for. Um, just a big bodied, very strong runner to complement what they already have. Um, and Devin Singletary, who's uh, a faster receiving type running back. I think that rounds out the running back room extremely, extremely well. And the Bills select a kicker, Tyler Bass, Georgia Southern. Um, Again, I, I really don't scout kickers. Um, not a hell of a lot of use in it. Knowing how many they missed, how what distance those misses were from, um, you really can't pull statistical analysis on wind conditions. So it, it's difficult to scout kickers unless you're actually there. So since I don't get paid as a professional scout, I don't look at kickers. Um, but yeah, 5'10", 185, kick for Georgia Southern. He's a senior. Um, yeah. He's a fucking kicker. <laughs> uh, so the Bills kicker has to worry about his job. Mr. Hauschka has replacement possibility drafted here. So um, Stephen Hauschka, they brought in competition for him before. He's one of the higher paid kickers in the league. So if this guy is close to Hauschka's capability in a competition, he's going to win the job because a, a rookie – is just simply not going to make the money that Steven Hauschka was. So Hauschka was rock fucking solid for the Bills for the first part of his career with the team. And then he got hurt. And he signed a new contract after having a not so good year. And I never really understood the money that they put into him in that deal 
um, after having a subpar year coming off of his injury. But I, I think it's just like, hey, we, we know you had a subpar year because you were dealing with injury. Um, but you're part of the reason that we made the playoffs. So, hey, let's sign you up. That's what I think his contract was mostly about. And uh, last year, he, he still did not produce in the way that he was a couple of years ago. So either the injury really took a lot away from him in, in terms of leg strength, or he's just, you know, wearing out and wearing down and not able to produce at the level he was. Because seriously, he was spot on from 50 plus yards. And now he's at a position where the coach won't even attempt um, field goals more than 50 yards. Won't even attempt it. He'd rather go for it on like fourth and seven than attempt a 50-yard field goal because he's not going to fucking make it. So I'm hoping Mr. Bass either lights a fire under Stephen Hauschka's ass or beats him out because they did definitely need an upgraded kicker. All right, so Jacksonville now drafts Oregon State quarterback Jake Lutton. So they didn't draft any of these quarterbacks earlier on, and they're drafting a quarterback now. Um, that just tells me, hey, Mr. Minshew, you have the job, okay? We're going to get a, a backup here, but Nick Foles is gone. We didn't draft one of these other quarterbacks. We want to see what you can do. And I think this is a smart marketing decision. Even if it's not a smart football decision, uh, what you need to worry about from Jacksonville is all of the things that build the finances. They don't have a winning program that draws a lot of fans in all the time. You need to do whatever you fucking can to sell jerseys and sell tickets. Oh. And having the mustache uh, that is Gardner Minshew at quarterback really sells with that team, really plays well. This guy played well nationally and really held the imagination of the country for a span of time. So um, you don't want to step on that. You want to have a guy who can sell jerseys and get fans in the stands. So I really like that they're obviously going with Minshew and they didn't draft a quarterback until this late where he's so obviously going to be a backup. It's nuts. So we've got the 49ers on the clock and they've had an interesting off season. Um, I really like that they're trading for, um, for Williams, the, um, the tackle out of Washington, it's been announced that they got him for, um, I want to say, what was it, a fourth round pick or a fifth round pick this year and a third round pick next year. That is fucking nothing. I I'm mildly upset that my team didn't get Trent Williams because of what, uh, how little uh, the 49ers had to give away to get him. So just that move is absolutely spectacular. And they started out with one of the best rosters in the fucking league. So adding talent like that to a very, very strong roster, <clears throat> it, it, it's almost unfair. <laughs> they, they're having a great off season and they're going to be a deep playoff contender yet again. Um, I don't see any NFC team really building up in a way that's going to compete well with them. And they're not imploding due to bad contracts in the way that the Rams did. They didn't need to get to the Super Bowl by buying it that year. So, yeah. 
I, I think they're much more sustainable, especially with the way that John Lynch has been able to approach the draft. He, he's just been masterful at, at accumulating picks um, and really selling trades. So here they are picking up a tight end, uh, Charlie Warner, <clears throat> tight end out of Georgia. Now, he was a favorite target of uh, Jake Fromm. So it could work out for them. Uh, six foot five, 245, runs a four seven, um, put up 21 reps. So strong for the tight end position for sure. And uh, relatively fast for the tight end position. Um, you cannot complain about that 40 time from a tight end. Um, so a guy who's six foot five, 245, um, that's quick. So I, I do, I like his measurables, but there, there's much better tight ends than him in this draft. Oh, okay, he's not the dynamic body control. I'm, I'm going to contort and find a way to get this catch. Uh, I'm going to run fantastic routes and just break away from people. He doesn't have the speed um, that the modern tight end um, is he's you know the old school tight end. He's just a big bodied guy who's going to be able to catch the ball at, at a contested high point. So yeah, um, getting him at this point with what you already have in George Kittle is you know pretty good. Um, they are, are a nasty team. They are a team that depends on the run and a mean push out of the offensive line. And Charlie here is a big bodied guy. So he's likely going to end up being a blocking tight end for them. So they can serve, uh, they can conserve George Kittle. Um, George Kittle is the best all around tight end in the league because not only is he an extremely good receiver in the way that Kelsey is, but he can also block extremely well. And Kelsey certainly does not get used in that way. They might actually be drafting this guy so they can give Kittle a break. Make it so he doesn't have to get involved in the run blocking as much. So they can spare him that and keep him available as the great receiving threat that he is. That, that's a situation that makes a lot of sense to me. You want to conserve your stars and make sure you're not overburdening them or else you're just going to burn them out. The Jets are on the clock. And again, they're having an effective draft. I'm mildly upset at how good of a draft the Jets are having um, with Mekhi Becton uh, and Denzel Mims. I wanted Denzel Mims. That is a damn good football player. So again, the Jets picking him up bothers me. I wanted him. Hmm. So let's see here. Trying to go through all of their draft picks and see exactly what they've dealt with already. So they've already dressed defensive back and um, offensive tackle and wide receiver here. So offensive guard is a position that I could see them going with. Uh, they definitely need a guard, uh, but linebacker core is terrible for that team as well. So I could see any of the interior offensive line positions or the linebacker positions going here for the Jets. <laughs> the pick is in. We're just waiting for it to actually be announced. Here we go. A punter. Why not? Brandon Mann, punter out of Texas A&M. So, um, now there's been a number of special teams specialists actually selected in this 
uh, fifth and sixth round period. Uh, there's been a couple of kickers, a punter, and a long snapper that have all gone. And um, I didn't necessarily see punter as a huge position of need for the Jets, if I'm honest. But hey, whatever. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't really speak much on punters. Um, nobody scouts these guys. Just nobody. I, I want to say Brandon Mann's probably the only one that has film floating around on YouTube that people are looking at, but that's about it. So the Packers on the clock here. And, and again, a very interesting draft that they've had. Um, they still have yet to address the offensive tackle position. They really needed a starter at tackle and never got there. Um, at this point in the draft, it's a little late for a, um, a draftable tackle. Um, Adams out of Washington is here, sure. But, you know, the, these tackles available at this point are, are not people that are going to develop into starters immediately, at least. So the Packers really kind of dropped the ball there in my mind. Um, but they do have um, a tight end that they picked up earlier, linebacker. Um, to kind of fill the void for Blake Martinez going. Um, they still have the Smith brothers, you know, Preston Smith and um, Zadarius Smith wreaking havoc on the edge of that 3-4 scheme that they're running. Um, middle linebackers would really help. Uh, again, they lost Blake Martinez. So, um, but no, they go with a guard. John Runyon, really? Okay. So Runyon is a name that people should remember. Um, Runyon, yeah, I'm assuming here this is the son of, or like nephew of uh, Mr. Runyon, who was the longtime outside, uh, uh, like left tackle for um, Philadelphia. One can only assume. Yep. Yeah, so he's probably only not a junior because of a different middle name. Uh, because John Runyon was the name of the prolific left tackle from well, for the Philadelphia Eagles, um, the Michigan product, who also this John Runyon is a Michigan product. Um, yeah, so it runs in the family. Um, these kind of players are the players you want late in the draft. Um, you can get a guy whose dad was a football player uh, in the league or whose uncle or, or brother or whatever it is, somebody who has familial ties to the league they're going to have access in a way that other people don't. They're going to know already what it takes to be to be a pro. They're going to have somebody in their family, in their ear, telling them, look, you got to work out in this way. You, you've got to devote yourself to, you know, your, your dietician's program, your, your trainer's program. You have to spend some of your own money on some quality coaching in the offseason, that sort of thing which these guys don't necessarily think about before they get into the league generally. Well, the son of a former Pro Bowl tackle is going to know what he needs to do as an offensive lineman coming into the league. He's just going to have more access. This guy grew up in NFL locker rooms. So, yeah, that's a solid, solid pick, and I really appreciate that. Um, I just don't think that they needed a guard as much as they needed a tackle there in Green Bay. So Rob Windsor, defensive tackle out of Penn State, is the Colts pick. Now, Windsor does uh, address a position of need for them. Sure, they, they had depth issues along the defensive front. Uh, this is a six foot four, 290 pound uh, defensive tackle who, well, in coming out of Penn State, you, you always worry uh, about somebody's production when somebody else who's very, very good is on the same defensive front. 
Uh, was his production as good as it was because other teams were worried about Itor Gross Matos? Or was his production very good because he was doing very good? Uh, this is a guy who's a little underweight for his position. As far as height goes, he, he's definitely tall enough for what he does, but he's a bit light. So he's going to have to put on some meat to um, effectively deal with the interior offensive line play of uh, the NFL. Uh, this is a defensive tackle who's going to be trying to push around, you know, 330 pound guards at, who have 40 pounds on them. So, yeah, he, he's going to need to put on some weight in order to be a week in, week out, bona fide starter in the league. But, you know, you're not drafting these guys to be starters. You're drafting these guys to be depth players and project players. So that's what he is. That's fitting in well. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are drafting next. They have already addressed some needs at running back and offensive tackle. Um, I would expect linebacker. Um, I think defensive secondary is, is such a huge need uh, for them. They could go there again. But no, they went middle of the defensive line with Khalil Davis. Now, I, I don't necessarily understand that as a priority here. I, I really think another defensive back or safety would have been the better bet because there's still plenty of value at those positions. Um, and their defensive secondary was just atrocious last year addressing the defensive line oh, yeah. you're getting a rotational player uh which is good you know they run a rotation that was very very effective last year they had the best run defense in the league so adding another body into that it, it, you know can be helpful but you're focusing on one of your strengths instead of trying to improve one of your weaknesses um, there is sound logic in that, um, just not the way I would have went. But let's see, we have Justin Heron, guard out of Wake Forest, going to New England here. And Heron is another one of those guys that a lot of people had going higher. Um, I've known a number of sources to have a third round grade on Justin Heron. Um, He's athletic enough at the position. So he's got good bend to him while still having the physical frame needed and the power. So, I mean, it looks like New England's effectively rebuilding their offensive line without necessarily spending high picks on it, which, again, they're having a great draft and I'm upset about it. Um, he's six foot four, 300 plus pounds that he's got the physical tools to be a solid pro NFL starter. So anytime you can get a player like that, even if it is at guard, which isn't a position that uh, is crazy valuable in the league, but if you can get a solid NFL starter in the sixth round, you're doing something good. All right. So now the Eagles are on the clock. And, again, their draft's been a little bit weird for me. Um, I did appreciate how they took Jalen Ragor, uh, but they really didn't need to draft a quarterback in the second round, and they totally did. And that's what everybody's going to be thinking about and talking about. Um, nobody's going to care about the fact that you drafted Jalen Ragor in the first round. Um addressing your most immediate need at wide receiver because you followed that up with drafting Jalen Hurts, who is a project quarterback in the second round. He's not going to be able to contribute immediately, and he's just going to piss off your starting quarterback. So remains to be seen how wise that decision will end up playing out to be. but. I don't agree with it right now. So anyways, the positions that I would expect them to go for would be linebacker. They, they really need linebackers in this defense. 
Um, they just don't have the talent. And that's where they go. Sean Bradley, uh, six foot one, 235 pound inside linebacker out of Temple. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Like I said, they, they needed a linebacker. They've needed linebackers there for some time. And late round linebackers are fine that because nobody's drafting them early. Uh, this guy will likely step in and compete for a starting role at the very least early. He's going to provide quality depth and good special teams play regardless. But I honestly expect him to be able to at least compete for a starting position very early in his career. Now, let's see. We've got the Lions on the clock. Now, they've gotten a running back, which they didn't need. Guard. And a corner. Now, I say running back, which they didn't need. Because, yeah, they have Kerryon Johnson. Um, I don't understand. And actually, they've drafted two running backs. So, Kerryon Johnson's got to be on his way out. That's the only explanation for me for how the Lions have approached this draft. It, like, they have to be assuming that Karrion Johnson is not going to be able to effectively come back from the injury that he had, and he's not going to be the same player. If that's not it, I don't understand why you draft two running backs in what they got the second and fourth round, I want to say. They spent those picks on running backs. So that's a lot of investment. If you're not assuming that you're not going to have your starting running back back, why are you investing that? It, it does not make sense unless Karrion Johnson's on his way out. That's it. So they've drafted defensive tackle John um, Panasini out of Utah. I, I've said it before uh, today. Utah has produced a number of NFL players and I think that this guy is, well, he's got no real chance at rushing the passer. Um, he's a 300 pound, six foot one guy with, he's really just a run plug. Uh, so he's going to be opening up the other defensive players. This is the right value position for that kind of player. Um, Matt Patricia has had some issues on the defensive line and run coverage has been bad. So it's a safe pick for Detroit. Hmm. Can't wait till my bills are on the clock, but the Steelers pick is in here. Steelers are having an effective draft. Um, solid linebacker out of Charlotte and drafting Chase Claypool to be opposite of Juju Smith-Schuster is going to be very good for that franchise moving forward. Um, they definitely needed to address the offense. They have effectively. Um, address the offense. They, they got what was the Maryland running back as well, um, which, of course, brings James Conner's position on the team into question. Anytime you draft a running back, um, that will bring into question the existing running backs you have because it's a position that you can get a guy in the fourth, fifth, or sixth round and find someone who's going to have an effective role on your team. Um, so, yeah. They're, they're sending an obvious message to James Conner. And here they are at pick 19 in the sixth, getting Antonio Brooks Jr., another Maryland product. Um, safety. Uh, this dude is 5'11", 220. So 
average height and weight for a safety, maybe a little on the smallish side. Um, running a 4 6 five, 40 time doesn't necessarily help you. So you can tell why he's a safety instead of a defensive back. Um, should I say corner? <laughs> but yeah, he's, um, he's a meh, um, nothing eye popping on the tape and another guy who's going to need to contribute on special teams in order to make the roster. we got the Rams on the clock. I'm intrigued by what the Rams do because they are in salary cap hell. Um, they did it to themselves. They signed players to ridiculous contracts that um, didn't end up working out. And when you trade for players, you, know, you got to pay up eventually. So in addition to Todd Gurley's dear deal biting them in the ass last year and this year. Um, I think that Jalen Ramsey's financial situation is going to really hurt them. Um, if they want to keep him, which why wouldn't you? You traded, I think, a first-round draft pick for him. Um, you've got to make sure that you come correct with the funds. And they just don't have all the funds for that, sir. They're in the process of building the roster, I'm assuming to make sure they know they can jettison the right people at the right time. So let's see. They have selected safety Jordan Fuller out of Ohio State. So Jordan Fuller is now the third Ohio State uh, DB taken. Barnett and Okuda were taken earlier in the draft. And when you're a safety and the corners are as good as they are, how good are you really? And yeah, that's going to be difficult for him to deal with. He's not going to have something. Oh, let's see. I'm losing track here for a moment. Jordan Fuller. Yeah, he, he's not had the defensive back help that a lot of other people have had. He's had the best defensive back help that you could possibly get as a safety. Um, now going to the Chargers, he, a team that's already drafted another safety. Um, I don't understand necessarily why they're going after the safety position here. Um, they've got a lot of depth there already. It's got to be special team stuff or they're pushing somebody off the roster because drafting two safeties when you already have a good defensive secondary that's loaded at safety, um, again, it is just got to be sending messages to the players that are currently on the roster that their job is on the line. Pick number 21 here uh, coming up in round six for the Eagles. I'm still enamored with the, um, the selection of Jalen Hurts. They've addressed linebacker like they needed to. They've addressed safety. They've addressed wide receiver like they needed to, but... Jalen Hurts going as early as he did has got to piss Carson Wentz the fuck off. That's a position where you could have drafted somebody who would have helped with a playoff run this year. But instead, you draft a guy whose injury insurance policy for your premier quarterback. It's... Here is your eventual maybe replacement next time you get hurt. Bad for you, good for us. That, that's the situation that the Eagles put Carson Wentz in. So I hope 
it, it lights a competitive fire under him. I really do. I, I, I just don't see the same level of compete in him that I do in Aaron Rodgers. So I assume Aaron Rodgers is going to be pissed off by the Jordan Love drafting. And that's going to drive him to very good things this year. I don't know how to judge Wentz and how he would react to Jalen Hurts. He, he just doesn't strike me as a guy who has the same level of compete in him that Aaron Rodgers does. So who knows? But here the Eagles have addressed wide receiver again. This is now the third time they've gone to a wide out. And they get Quez Watkins um, out of Southern Mississippi. Now, let's see. Quez, six feet tall, 185. Scrawny guy. But again, scrawny but fast. Uh, this is the second time now where they've gotten just a, a shrinky dink that has speed. Uh, he's a 4 three forty guy. So, um... Yeah, him with Jalen Ragor, you're talking about a lightning quick offensive squad uh, where all of the wide receivers are shrinky dinks that can just run past you. Um, that's going to be interesting if they can develop him into an every down uh, player or at least a player that has a decent role on the team. That'll, that'll develop an amount of team speed that a, a lot of teams have a hard time dealing with. You've got a strong arm quarterback in Wentz, so just somebody who can run underneath it is valuable. That's why they went and got Sean Jackson. Um, he didn't stay healthy, but Considering all the small, speedy players that they're adding to the roster, uh, Deshaun Jackson's as good as gone. All right. If he wasn't already, he is cut tomorrow. Minnesota's on the clock. They're having a solid draft. Um, I, I can't complain at all with what they're doing there. Other than when you trade a wide receiver away for a first round draft pick and you use that first round draft pick on a receiver. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It, considering the holes and the other value that were at positions when they uh, drafted Jefferson. Yeah. But otherwise they did quite well. Jeff Gladney is a perfect fit for that defensive secondary. And um, they address corner again a little later on in the draft. Um, with a starting capable corner. Now, considering they lost both of their starting uh, corners earlier in the offseason, um, Trey Waynes, Xavier Rhodes, gone. They needed an influx of talent. And they've done well picking it up. But the Vikings did not actually make a selection. They traded the pick, which was initially part of that um, Denzel Mim, uh, not Denzel Mims, um, Stefan Diggs trade um, from Buffalo. And they have now traded that pick to Baltimore. So Baltimore is on the clock. And it's always interesting to me, the sixth round trades. Just, mm. Baltimore has selected James Proach, or Proachy, wide receiver from Southern Methodist. Now, yeah, 5'11", 201, speedy guy. All uh, he's kind of average as a wide receiver, kind of all average. So I don't understand why you're trading up to get a guy like that. 
you're using resources, but is he the last person that you think is decent at wide receiver? <laughs> yeah, trading up in later rounds is weird to me. Always has been. Because the likelihood of you and the other teams being on the same person, very slim. Very, very slim. The further you go down in the draft, the more erratic it is. And the more unlike uh, all of these scouting departments are with who they rate um, as the best available. Um, there's just so much variance between scouting departments. It's impossible to have the same grades on the same people unless they are so painfully, obviously good. And, and now at this point, I mean, I could have people that I've rated in the fifth or sixth round or even the third round that are still available. And you know, the teams could start drafting players that I would have assumed would go undrafted or vice versa. So, yeah, personal opinion changes all of these things. And with different people in the room, you're... Um, you're getting so much variance between these rooms. There's no point in my mind trading up in the sixth round. Just none. The likelihood of anybody else being on that same wide receiver is just absolutely nothing. So we got the Cardinals coming up here. Cardinals fed a successful draft. They've gotten an offensive tackle. Um, and... Simmons. I was not expecting Simmons to be available, um, but I should have. I, actually, in an earlier mock draft, I had Simmons falling as much as pick 15 because having a positionless player is nice, but he's still a positionless player. He, he's not um, viewed as a, a blue chip can't miss sort of thing when he doesn't have an a fully defined uh, realm. So uh, a lot of people are going to undervalue a position like that and undervalue a player like that. And players like him fall all the fucking time. So I, I kind of anticipated him falling possibly, but I did think the giants were, were a honest chance at a destination for Simmons, but Falling to the Cardinals the way he did, they just snapped him up instead of addressing their needed tackle, and they lost out on all of the better tackles because of that. So it's going to be really dicey to gauge what's going on with the Cardinals. They're going to be judged by that Simmons pick. Of course, they're going to improve their defense with him, for sure. They're just not going to protect Kyler Murray as well with him and a different tackle later on in the draft. Mm. Man. They are dragging ass right now. So the pick is in. They're just not telling us uh, who the pick is because, you know, they probably got to sell us some more cars. Um, here we go. Evan Weaver, linebacker out of California. So, another player I really don't have a lot on. Um, the Cal product, I, I was scouting that school really for Ashton Davis. Um, not a hell of a lot of talent on the Cal defense. So... I did not get a lot of positive vibes off of Weaver. He's got the build. Uh, runs a 4'7". He's 6'2", 237. Um, he could stand to put a little more weight on his frame, a little more muscle. Um, but he's just a meh kind of player. He's going to be a special teams contributor. 
Uh, no real chance for him to get into a starting position. I'm not sure really ever. Um, but three, four years down the line with some NFL experience, um, maybe. The Vikings are now yet again on the clock after making some trades here. And uh, yeah, they still got some things. They still got stone safety out of Iowa that fits a need. But um, yeah, everything's kind of winding down here. Hmm. All right, so yet another situation where the pick is in, and they're just taking their damn sweet time telling us what's going on. Um, everybody's just drafting for depth now. They're not drafting for need. So whereas they have a safety need, um, yeah, uh, it, you're not necessarily finding somebody who matches the kind of talent that you want on your team. So here they go. Uh, offensive tackle, Blake Brendel, uh, six foot seven, 300 pound Oregon state guard. And uh, I'm sorry, tackle, um, Oregon, uh, the Ducks, had the best offensive line in the country, really. Uh, but I wanted to say this guy was Oregon State, not Oregon. So I've got to brush up on that real quick. Got the Patriots on the clock. The Bastards having a good draft. Um, are they going to get their quarterback? Uh, 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 no. They're going with Stidham. Everybody said they're going to go with Stidham. Um, they're one of the only programs in the country that's actually honest about that shit. Uh, just nobody believed that they were going with Stidham. Kind of hope they would have drafted Jake Fromm. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, Blake Brandle was Oregon State, not Oregon. So, but either way, six foot seven, three hundred seven pounds at a guard position. He's a bit big for a guard. So now you have Kirk Cousins. If this guy's in front of him, has gonna he's got to find passing lanes around the dude. You know, you don't want to whack your offensive guard in the back of the head with the football. Uh, Kirk Cousins isn't like 6'5", like some of these other quarterbacks in the league. So he's going to have to work around that if this guy ends up developing into a starter. My dog just got up from a little nap and headbutted the side of the computer. Just trying to turn around in a circle. I don't know if she wasn't paying attention or what, but she just ran headlong into the side of the laptop for no reason. Come here, dude. Come on. Come on. I know. If Bill Belichick can draft with his dog, I can talk about the draft with my dog. Speaking of Belichick, Patriots are on the clock. Pick is in. Just waiting on it to be announced. And we got the Vikings coming up behind that. Again, Patriots having an extremely good draft, mostly on the defensive side. Uh, they have gotten an offensive lineman tight end, but um, it, it's really the defensive ads that they've had that have um, really surprised me and I just kind of jealous of. But let's see where they go. Yeah, you know, they no longer have Brady. They no longer have Gronk. And they've got a lot of needs on offense. But there's no way that they have enough uh, assets to deal with all of those holes in one offseason. 
So Belichick's been doing the smart thing and building up the defense, letting the offense suck ass, and he's going to get himself a nice high draft pick next year. So he's likely going to be in the Trevor Lawrence sweepstakes. So linebacker Kasa Maluya out of Wyoming. Now, Wyoming has now put a couple of linebackers into the league in this draft. When I was watching film on Wyoming, they're they're not like popping off the screen, okay? But they do run a pro style program. So players coming out of there translate to, you know, what they need to do in the league extremely, extremely well. Um, Maluia wasn't anything special. Okay. So maybe our man Belichick sees him as just an immediate contributor um, on special teams because that's likely where he's going to have to make his name to stay on the roster. Let's see, the guy's six foot, 250. Yeah, I don't necessarily care about awards uh, from any of these people, because especially coming from a small schools conference or um, like the Mountain West Conference, I think they're in. um, Awards mean nothing. You know, uh, Boise State product, Curtis Weaver, is the career leader in sacks for the Mountain West division. And he ended up going in the fifth round. So doesn't say much for any sort of accolades that you get as a small school player. So we've got the Vikings, the Jags, and then my Buffalo Bills again. Maybe they can disappoint me again. So they've drafted a backup quarterback and a kicker, which is really exciting. Um, But the earlier two picks, I was, again, extremely, extremely, extremely happy with. The second and third round picks, I was elated with. Um, mm. Minnesota selects safety out of Michigan, Josh Josh, uh, Metellus. I've said it before, Michigan is a pro-style program. So getting somebody out of a pro-style program... Um, it is always beneficial later in the draft. They, um, they're just going to know what they have to do to stay on the team. He'll put the work in and that really all you can ask out of a sixth rounder, a, a guy that puts in the work to stay on the team. He's going to have to need to be quality depth. Um, he, he might end up getting scout team reps. Just whatever you can do to hang on is what he's going to do. Jaguars picking at 27 here. They've had a very interesting draft. I've liked it quite a bit, actually. Um, they just had so many holes. So they created holes that they didn't necessarily need to deal with. Um, A lot of it through trading players away. Yannick Ngakwe is trying to join the ranks of people that were traded away. It doesn't look like he's going to end up getting his way. Looks like they're going to try and force him to just sign the franchise tender and shut up and play. Hmm. So it looks like there's been a bit of Might have been a trade here. No. No, 
Uh, it's just some stupid going on on my screen here. Let me make some adjustments. Yeah, the, 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 the Jaguars are still on the clock. This is a pick that was traded to them from Seattle. And then we'll get to it with my Buffalo Bills. The pick is in for the Jaguars. They're not necessarily telling us what the hell's going on. But hey, you know, we need commercials instead. Jaguars had so, so many holes. Um, I don't think any player really wants to play out more than their first contract with that team. Um, they need to revamp the culture desperately. Um, whatever the hell was being done to that locker room by Tom Coughlin, they didn't like it. Um, when he was with the Giants, um, he was almost run out of town because of his relationship with Michael Strahan and Eli Manning. Um, they did what they needed to to make adjustments, and he stayed, and he ended up winning Super Bowls with them. But the fact remains that when unchecked, Tom Coughlin is a dickbag to his players. So I was not surprised to see him pushed out of town. But the culture that he's created seems to remain. So he, he they really need fresh faces there. I, I think Marone needs to go, and, and they just need a fresh start. Um, here they select tight end Tyler Davis out of Georgia Tech, 6'4", 240, and not really anybody that anybody's put anything into. This guy is not going to show up in a lot of draft guides. Um, don't have any workout results on him. And I did not personally watch film on him. Uh, the Georgia Tech um, program didn't, in my mind, warrant scouting anybody for the pro game. So, yeah, the delineation between what's actually happening and what the draft guides are laying out is more obvious in later rounds. But... Yeah, having literally nothing on Mr. Davis other than his height and weight is not leaving me a hell of a lot of things to talk about. So let's talk about the bills here coming up. This is Baltimore's original pick. Came to them with a trade um, with New England. And... Not a lot of needs on this roster. Uh, they have drafted pretty oddly the past few rounds. First two picks that they had were pretty solid with Epinesa and um, Zach Moss. After that, a wide receiver that nobody's heard of, nobody had a grade on uh, as a draftable player, goes in the third round. and. They picked up Jake Fromm, and they picked up a kicker. So, kind of odd. I did not believe that they needed Jake Fromm in any way. And, yeah, drafting a kicker at any point is an oddity. So the Bills pick is in wide receiver Isaiah Hodgins out of Oregon State. Uh, 6'4", 210. Um, as stated earlier, with the offensive lineman that was selected, haven't done a heck of a lot of homework on the Oregon State program. We don't have full workout figures on Isaiah Hodgins. But he did run a 4-6-40 time, so 
six three two ten is not a terrible time for his size, but it's not like game breaking speed or anything of that nature either. So um, they're obviously just creating depth or focusing on their special teams because that is definitely the body type of a gunner. So more of a special teams add in my mind than anything. And we have Green Bay on the clock, two picks in a row here. So they go ahead and pick up the Aragon, the Oregon center, Jake Hansen. Really surprised an Oregon offensive lineman goes this far down the board because yet again, Oregon had the best offensive line in the country. It was a fantastic offensive line there at Oregon. Um, Justin Herbert really should be sending those guys some nice things because them keeping him clean is what gave him the opportunity to put up the figures that he did. He, he tends to be very, very deliberate in his decision-making. And if he didn't have solid blocking, that shit wouldn't work. So, yeah, I, again, surprised to see the Oregon center go this late in the draft, considering the accolades that that offensive line got. Green Bay is on the clock, two picks in a row here, though. Addressing the offensive line a little late here, but they are addressing the offensive line. With players that can likely end up starting. So, you know, Aaron Rodgers should be happy with that. Probably won't be, you know. But he does have that majestic mustache, so I think he'll be fine. Hmm. I've always liked the two picks in a row setup. Fantasy football drafts, when you get the top pick or the last pick, and you get a couple in a row, you can control what the trends are. Um, you, know, you can control other people having a run. Oh. <sighs> At a particular position, just by snapping up two quickly. And here we are getting a tackle now for Green Bay. Simon Stepaniak out of Indiana. 6'4", 300 pounder. Um, anytime you're getting a tackle this far down in the draft, you're looking at a right tackle prospect. And the Indiana product is going to be no different. Indiana is another one of those schools where uh, it just works well for offensive linemen. Um, the weather that they have, the, the kind of game that they need to operate in, they actually do need to spend a lot of time scouting offensive linemen because it would not work without them. So getting one out of that program, is, it could be successful. Um, he's an extremely strong product, but uh, he's not the most polished guy. So, yeah, he's tackle depth. Hmm. He could over time develop into being a starting right tackle, but he just doesn't have the movement and flexibility for the left tackle spot. Eagles are on the clock again. Let their interesting draft continue. Oh, man. Slowly wrapping this up. Coming to the end of the sixth round. I wonder who Mr. Irrelevant's going to be. I wonder how they're going to get the jersey to him. <laughs> Typically, the 255th pick, they've got that Mr. Irrelevant Jersey just waiting at the podium for him, like real jerks. So you got to assume that they're going to still give Mr. Irrelevant the Mr. Irrelevant Jersey. 
Um, I just don't know how they're going to get it to him. Hmm. The Eagles, I think, are in for a boom. I think that they are dealing with all the wide receiver injuries and still managing to get to the playoffs last year showed how tough they are as a team. Now, after the moves that they've made in this offseason, hopefully they won't have the same kind of health concerns that they did last year. And we'll be able to see what this offense can really do with a healthy Carson Wentz all season, like they had last year. Mind you, he got hurt in the playoffs, pretty much ruining their chances of advancing. Um, but he had he was healthy all season, which is what most fans in Philly were, I'm sure, praying for in the offseason. Man, they are just slowing everything down. There's no reason for it to be this slow, this late in the draft. Taking up all of the time you can possibly get. It's only like a three-minute time frame that they have between picks at this point. So you would think that they'd be ready for it and just kind of rapid-fire these things. Unless the Packers just picked both of the people that the freaking Eagles were looking at. So the pick's in, and the Jets are on the clock, so we're just waiting for them to announce it at this point. Hmm. Hmm. I think I'm cutting this short at the end of the sixth round because the seventh round players, nobody knows who the hell they are. Nobody cares. And I'm starting to wind down. There we go. Prince Tego Anogo. Tackle. Out of Auburn. Auburn had a fantastic defensive line, but um, not really well known for their offensive line play this past year. Guys, six foot five, 300 pounds. Good arm length, so he's got the size for sure. Again, Auburn really not known for their offensive line play. It was all that defense. So mm-hmm. <laughs> With the Jets. There we go. So the Auburn tackle. Ah, okay. So total project player. Uh, Prince Tegawanogo, the tackle that the uh, Eagles just drafted. He came to the sport late. That's why I don't really have much on him. Anything, really. Um, anytime you don't really come to football until you're in your college career, you might still be building up. And if he's only been playing the sport a few years, most of these guys have been playing the sport their whole lives. So being fresh to it as he is he, he's entirely a project player so 
So the Jets on the clock here. And after these guys and a couple of picks from the Colts, again, I am likely going to cut this at the end of the sixth round because the seventh round is going to be loaded with players that neither you nor I have heard of and none are likely to make the team. The Colts still have some depth needs. Uh, they could use a wide out. Uh, they could use defensive line help. But overall, I like their roster. I, I like the build of it. They uh, build from the inside out. So the defensive line, the linebacking core, the offensive line are very well established. So they're really just drafting depth. They definitely needed some skill position help, and they got it in this draft. T.Y. Hilton wasn't going to be the only good receiver on this team forever, you know? But it's going to be a bit of a snoozer here because they've got three picks in a row to knock out because they just traded with the Jets. Hmm. I'm always interested in who the heck you're trading for this late in the draft. Like the likelihood of these guys doing a damn thing for you is so slim. Why is it worth giving up any resources whatsoever? So we got Isaiah Rogers, defensive back out of Massachusetts. Yet another guy who there's no draft guide on whatsoever. He, we we don't know height, weight, speed. We don't know. Well, no, we do. We know height and weight. Um, 5'10", 170. I've got no film on the guy. I've got no combine workout data on him whatsoever. And... This is why we're cutting things at the end of the sixth round here, because this is going to happen way too often. This is just telling me the amount of homework I got to do on these people, and that's it. So again, Colts with two more picks. And then the Seattle Seahawks wrap up the end of the sixth round. Oh, man. All right. So a player that we know something about. So, a wide receiver, Desmond uh, Patman, out of Washington State, 6'4", 225, 4'4", guy. So, he's got the physical build of a gunner in punt coverage. And that will likely be his way onto the team. Let me see if the guy actually has any special teams experience. Yeah, it doesn't have the quickness 
that you'd like and doesn't seem to have the dog mentality that you like out of the gunner position either. So I have a, uh, yeah, I have a suspicion that he's not likely to make the team because special teams is the only way you're going to get on. And there's got to be a lot of fight in that dog in order to do well on special teams. Hmm. All right, well, I'm cutting this a little early. I'm We're running across now close to 60% players that I've got no scouting data on whatsoever from multiple sources or my own. Um, and the likelihood of these guys making the team is slim to none at this point. If Mr. Irrelevant makes the roster and develops into a solid Pro Bowl kind of player, you know, you can rub it in my face later on. But that is it for today's draft conversation. Sorry, I started it a bit late. Um, but I think we got some good action in with the fourth and fifth round. As it get into the sixth round here, we started to just kind of tail off and die. So I will see you guys in the draft grade videos coming out in the next few days. Later.